It's good. No, this, is this good also or is it too loud? It's good, okay. Okay, I think we can start assuming live stream is going on also. Looks like it's working on my iPad. Okay, great. Well, good to see everyone. I've been traveling and giving lectures in part on this topic at different places. That's why I couldn't attend the several lectures, but hopefully you had a good introduction to many interesting topics by Juan and Mohammed more recently yesterday. Was it interesting? Crossing in memory. We wanted to make this course a lot more research oriented uh, so that you're really up to date of what, with what's going on in computer architecture, as opposed to making it yet another boring course that covers the basics again and again and again. Uh, I think it's good to look forward. So that's why we started with a lot of research topics, crossing in memory being one of them. And yesterday we talked about genom genomics acceleration. There's a lot more to talk about in that topic, but we'll see. And we'll have some le resource lectures also. It's a bit louder than I would like, but I'll try to reduce it a little bit uh, if I can find it. Okay, is this better? At least I don't hear an echo right now. Okay, that's much better, I think. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have more research lectures also on the topics that we've covered. Uh, but today uh, I'm going to cover uh, Rohammer and related issues. Well, mainly Rohammer, but you can imagine some other related issues also. How many people learned about Rohammer before? Probably if you've taken my digital design and computer architecture you have. How many people have not? Don't be shy. Okay, that's good. See, this course brings together people from different streams, let's say. Some people take digital design and computer architecture. Some people haven't taken anything in architecture, in fact, in their institutions. But hopefully something, hopefully they will uh, get ready to do well in the course still. Okay, so let's jump into Rowhammer. Uh, before I jump into Rowhammer, I'll motivate it a little bit at a higher level. Let me see. I want to make sure this works. Okay. How many people know this person? Yes. yes. It's Abraham Maslow, a very famous American psychologist. He had a lot of impact on psychology, uh, especially personality psychology in the 20th century. Uh, and he is probably most famous for, I don't know why this is not working, this thing. Oh, not that thing. This thing. <laughs> this is the hierarchy of needs uh, that he has developed. And it's a nice, a framework for understanding why human beings do the things they do. And he basically uh, hypothesized that human beings first need to have their physiological needs and safety needs satisfied before they can think about higher level constructs like love, friendship, uh, or self-esteem, or other as prestige. And this is highest forms of abstract arts, let's say, creative abilities, right? So you don't care about art if your security is threatened, for example. And I think that's true for computers as well. We don't really care about how high performance we can make the computers if we don't make them work reliably well, right? And, and when, you, when you think about computers, I think I'd like you to also think about it as a, a more general thing. Computers are not just these things, right? These are computers, yes, and they're good, they're fine. Maybe they're not as safety critical, but we also send computers to space, right? And think about those computers. Those computers are a lot more safety critical and people are envisioning that we're gonna live out in space. Now think more about that, what that means for computing. If we design the computers the way they are today, maybe we're not gonna live out in the space very well going into the future. Because computers have a lot of reliability and security issues today, as we will see in this lecture. And that, that affects the safety and security of the systems. Okay, so I also showed this picture. How many people know this bridge? Okay, not because you saw it in my earlier lectures, hopefully. How many people know about, oh, you, you didn't see it in my earlier lectures. Okay, what is this then? That's right, yes, this collapses. How do you know that it collapses? Okay, you've seen the video. That, certainly not in my lectures because I don't show the video in my lectures. I have a link probably, but, but yes, this is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in 1940 uh, that was constructed around Tacoma Narrows, around Seattle area, basically. Uh, and it doesn't exist today, as you mentioned, uh, because a bit flip happened in it. 
I called a bit flip. And this is a picture of how it collapses. But yes, there's a video of it also, actually, because it was expected to collapse because it was doing this for six months or so, basically. And this is a clearly a reliability problem. I call it a bit flip. Clearly, that's an exaggeration, right? But a bit flip can cause this also in the end in a real computer, assuming this was a computer. Uh, but this could also be a security and a safety problem as well. So what happened to this bridge is this doesn't exist anymore. They built two bridges on the same place. And now you have a dual modular redundancy. Basically, if one bridge fails, you can actually go on the other bridge. This is called, this is a basic reliability principle, right? You add redundancy to avoid failures. So if you have two bridges, if one fails, you can use the other one. And you can actually increase that to n modular redundancy. And that's a very basic reliability principle. But that's a very costly reliability principle also, right? You replicate the thing n times. And you can actually do analyses on how, uh, uh, how, uh, how much reliability, how many faults you can tolerate uh, as well. So that's one way of actually solving reliability issues, right? Have two copies of this computer execute the same program and pick the one that's correct. How do you know which one is correct? Well, if you have two copies, you don't know which one is correct when one is faulty, right? So you need to have three copies. So a two modular redundancy usually doesn't work. So you really need to have three copies so that you can vote on the output of the program. Does that make sense? So now you, now you increase your cost by 3x if you want to tolerate a single bit error in a program. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself, but these are actually topics that can be inspired by what we build as infrastructure in real life as well, not just computing. So another picture over here, these people are constructing a big city over here. They're sitting on this rod. If that rod has a bit flip, then you may have a problem, right? These people may not be very happy. They look quite happy right now, but they may not be very happy. So I think uh, going forward, we really need to think about security and safety uh, in, in more general terms. So far, we've kind of been, if, I mean, you may not know the history of how computer safety and security have been developed, but we've kind of been sloppy on how we do safety and security in our systems. Like this thing doesn't have any much guarantees, basically. If it gets a bit flip, too bad. You restart your computer and we've gotten used to it, right? But that's not how it can work in a picture that looks like this, right? Well, this is a joke, of course, but the self-driving car circa 1994 by Mr. Bean. Clearly, he's pulling some strings to drive the car. But this is his vision of a self-driving car. Today, we have more sophisticated self-driving cars. But can we really trust them is a big question, of course, right? If you have these bit flips that are happening all over, if your hardware is not reliable, software is not reliable, I don't think you would be as comfortable as this guy sitting on top or wherever uh, on this car. You don't want to be there, perhaps. So I think uh, so. Uh, this, this is a very general uh, uh, thinking about security, but I think we need to tr strive to achieve this going into the future because uh, when, when we put our computers out into the field, we will have a lot of unforeseen consequences. And I like the space example that I gave earlier. Self-driving car is another example. You will have a lot of unforeseen consequences that you may not have uh, trained the car on. And we're having a lot of these issues right now when uh, different cars drive in the streets and they hit pedestrians. They are not able to see the pedestrians because that was not on their training set. So basically, we're, a lot, we're having a lot of safety issues related to our cars today even. If, if this is compounded by reliability issues that also compound the safety issues, then we have a problem going into the future. So basically, if a bit flip happens over here, can we still reliably drive this car? And can we still trust it? That's the question. I don't know. <laughs> so let me tie into the bit flip. So Rohammer is about bit flips. Since we've been talking about memory in this course uh, a lot so far, we're going to be talking about memory for a while because of what Juan mentioned in the earlier course, right? Memory is the most of the system today. More than 95% of the resources that we have in a single node is dedicated to memory. And if you actually expand it to bigger data centers, it's really getting closer to 99% or so. The, the real estate is really in memory. Uh, so Rohammer is uh, the fact that you can predictably induce bit flips in commodity DRAM chips. So DRAM, uh, dynamic random access memory, is the memory technology used in all computers today, including safety critical systems. Uh, and uh, I will show you that uh, earlier experiments about a decade ago, a little bit over a decade ago, showed that more than 80% of the tested DRAM chips are vulnerable to this. And I'm going to show you more recent 
results also. We're going to cover history of this over the course of about 10 years or so. And we're going to see, of course, why this happens a little bit. And this is, uh, as far as we know, the first example of how a simple hardware failure mechanism at the hardware level, circuit level, uh, can cause a serious widespread system security vulnerability. So it's really making a connection between uh, reliability of hardware and the security of system in the end. And we're going to see some history toward the end of this lecture. Hopefully, we'll get to it uh, in slide 220 or so. <laughs> Uh, a history of what, what people have done before this. I don't want to give that history right now. I want to go into the topic right away. But we'll look at the history of what people tried to do to establish this connection because people were worried about this connection for a long time, long before Rohammer came about, right? They always thought uh, if you have some unreliable hardware, they will lead to, it will lead to security issues also. In fact, Byzantine failures. How many people know about Byzantine failures? Leslie Lamport, 1982. Transactions on programming languages and systems? No one? Okay, then wait until the history. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is essentially a failure in a distributed system where uh, one, uh, one node is untrusted for whatever reason. It may have a bit flip. It may be because it's, it has an error or it may be malicious, maliciously trying the system. Basically, these two things are equal from that perspective. You, you can have a malicious node or you can have an erroneous node and they both are equal, and you really need to protect against them if you really want to make a distributed decision in a distributed system. That's what Byzantine failure is all, all about. I'm going to mention that later on. And Rohammer is an example of a Byzantine failure, essentially. You basically get a bit flip. It's an error, but it's also a security problem at the same time. Okay, as a result, people are writing uh, articles. These are general public type of articles like this. Forget software, now hackers are exploiting physics. I like this one because it's true, actually. It's really true to the fundamentals of Rohammer. It's really a physical problem. Okay, let me give you a little bit history uh, from our perspective, at least especially from my perspective, on how we arrived at this. Uh, so uh, memory technology scaling is a tough area. Basically, uh, as you scale the size of the memory cell, it becomes noisy, it becomes less reliable. I'm going to show you the example of uh, DRAM soon. And we were always very interested in like, what happens next if you actually have these scaling issues, technology scaling issues. And uh, we wrote this paper uh, about 10 years ago and delivered an invited talk where we argued that these issues are going to become much, much worse into the future. And at that time, we didn't have a whole lot of evidence, but we were working on gathering the evidence. This was this more like a position saying that, okay, memory technology scaling is going to get a whole lot worse. We'll we're going to see a lot more reliability issues that's going to affect our security and safety, not only reliability. And also, we're going to have a lot of data movement related issues. Uh, that is going to exacerbate the energy overheads of our systems, and this is going to compound and compound. So we need to solve the problem somehow. So we need to take it. And then our, 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 our uh, argument was to uh, take a systems architecture perspective, because you can take a perspective saying that, okay, it's not my problem <laughs> as a system designer, right? Or as a software designer, it's not my problem. This technology scaling issue is a problem of the company that's manufacturing the DUM chip. Let them solve it. That's, of course, a potentially valid position, but unfortunately, they don't have the means to solve all of this. They're, uh, they're pushing the technology hard so that you can get, let's say, high-density chips. Maybe they can make other design decisions to make the trade-offs between density, reliability, and uh, latency different. And we're going to talk about that later in later lectures of this course, the trade-offs between latency and reliability, for example, and the trade-offs between density uh, and latency. At the same time, these are all this is a trade-off space basically. So, and manufacturers actually uh, uh, thread a thin rope when they actually make these trade-offs. Uh, and usually, they make the trade-off that oh, we want more capacity because systems want more capacity, so they increase the density of the memory chip. And this is clearly not very good for reliability or latency in the end. Uh, so, uh, systems really demand this density. Uh, but some of these problems, as we will see, also are not easy to solve at the device level or at least they're very, very costly to solve at the device level. That's why we argue that you should really take a whole stack perspective. The system should be co-designed together with the memory so that we can actually prevent these issues or mitigate these issues so that they don't become very big issues. Does that make sense? I mean, it may be a little bit high level right now, but if you read this, I don't think if we assign this as reading. Have we assigned this as reading? Not yet. <laughs> 
you'll have a lot of readings in the homeworks in this course, and a lot of them are going to be optional extra credits. That's actually a good way of gaining credit in this course if you're worried about the exam or labs. You do the extra credit review assignments. I would recommend doing that. But yes, uh, that's the idea, basically. Uh, don't uh, uh, take a more whole stack perspective to solve the problem. But let's take a look at the problem first. The problem is really a device level or circuit level problem. This is the DRAM cell. And uh, I can put any storage technology over here. Uh, DRAM cell, uh, it, but let's take a look at like DRAM because the, the problem is specific to DRAM. And then we're going to talk about other issues and other technologies later. But DRAM is a charge-based technology. In later lectures, we'll see resistive technologies uh, like emerging memory technologies and flash memory technology also. Uh, uh, well, flash is charge-based, but it operates differently. Uh, but basically, in DRAM, uh, in order to store data, you need to uh, capture some charge in this capacitor. So if you have charge, you, it, it, it's a one. If you, have, if you don't have charge, it's a zero. You could do the encoding that way, for example. Uh, and this capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing and little noise and little disturbance. And then you have the access transistor, and this access transistor allows you to read the charge and sense the charge to figure out whether this is a one or a zero, basically. Uh, and it's not just the excess transistor, it's the bit line and the sense amplifier. So this circuitry is uh, as small as it gets today, and people are trying to make it smaller and smaller. So for this to work, so what I just described to you is a storage device and an access device, right? This, this needs, uh, any, any memory needs both of these, a storage device and an access device. And if you want memory to be reliable, both of these need to be reliable. The storage device needs to be reliable, and the access device needs to be reliable. Uh, in this case, capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing, and the access transistor must be large enough for, again, reliability, little noise, low leakage, high retention time. Uh, now, if, as you reduce the size of both, it turns out these properties become much more difficult to maintain. You run into a lot of reliability issues. First of all, the charge here reduces, uh, and uh, the, the transistor here reduces, so it becomes difficult to transmit the charge. So everything becomes a lot more noisy. So imagine over here, you have only one atom right, in the capacitor. As you reduce things, you may actually get to that point. How do you sense that atom? So basically, things become much more, much more difficult to uh, maintain reliably and also read reliably. So that's the problem, basically, when you reduce the size of this. And people actually play a lot of tricks uh, to design the capacitor as access transistor and the circuitry over here. This is, this is an abstraction. It doesn't look like this in real circuits. In real circuits, what you do is capacitor is a three-dimensional structure. Basically, you etch it like this inside uh, the silicon. Basically, it's, it's not very. Really, it doesn't look like this. Basically, I, I will show you a picture in a later lecture. Uh, but if, essentially, the capacitor, I believe, is about 40, 50 x, maybe 70 x right now. I don't know. Don't quote me exactly on it. Uh, the length of the capacitor is about 70 times the length of the access transistor, because that's how it uh, it is done today. So it's very tough to manufacture these things, actually. It's not easy. And partially, that's the problem. And uh, OK, basically, uh, the capacity, cost, and energy, and power are hard to scale. And as you reduce the size of the cell, uh, it becomes uh, more noisy. So let's take a look at some real data from the field uh, of how this affects real systems. So this is a paper uh, we wrote with Facebook in 2015. We were doing these studies around 2013, 14, in, in fact, even 2012. Uh, but basically, we analyzed all of the memory errors that we see in the production data centers that Facebook has at the time, had at the time. So this is 10 years ago, right? Facebook has grown a lot today. But this is a lot of servers, a lot of memory. Uh, in fact, uh, it's amazing how much memory and how many servers that they had even at that time. And they didn't allow us to write it in the paper because they were worried that this would affect their stock price because the people would know how big their infrastructure is, right? Maybe they should be worried about other things that they're doing uh, that are a bit more shady than building infrastructure, let's say. Uh, but anyway, uh, we did this study, and this is a correlation study. We basically measured uh, how many errors that you get and how, much, how many server failures that you get and correlated it with uh, the chip density employed in the different servers. Because different servers in, in different data centers have different DRAM chips, and you can basically correlate the chip density that's employed in the server with this server failure rate that you get in terms of the error rate that is reported by the DRAM. And if you really want to know what this is, you need to read the paper. I don't, we don't have time to cover it right now uh, because you need to do some normalization to actually get that relative server failure rate because these are different servers, right, clearly. Uh, 
But basically, the key takeaway is if the chip density that's employed in the server is uh, denser, meaning larger capacity, four gigabit chips, uh, then you get more failures, more errors, essentially. And this is a very strong correlation across many, many data points. So it's very hard, hard to argue with real data from the field. And this paper has a lot more data, actually, uh, that we wrote with one of my PhD students. It, it has a lot more data, uh, and also together with Facebook, uh, on, on other uh, analyses of the errors. So the, the question is, why is this happening? Well, this is correlation, not causation. But, uh, but uh, the hypothesis we have, essentially, is that cells in a denser DRAM chip are smaller. And also, they're closer to each other. They're packed together. Basically, in a given millimeter square, you have many, many more cells packed. And these cells are storing less charge compared to their predecessors, if you will. And they're more vulnerable to noise. As a result, these noise effects manifest themselves as errors, memory errors. And at the system level, you get server failures. So I think this is fascinating. If you really want to understand the like, different types of errors, you can take a look at the paper. And there are other papers that are written on this topic also. But this is, uh, I believe this is the, uh, even though we were not able to report the size of the uh, data set that we have, I believe this is the largest data set that has ever been published. There are other data sets that are published from national labs for example, but the infrastructure of national labs is really minuscule compared to infrastructure of Facebook, I should say. Okay, and this is the paper, if you're interested in looking at it. And maybe this could, this is, this could be one of the papers that are potential readings, right? Because it's a little bit different from what we're going to discuss uh, later. So this study is interesting, and we were very interested in doing these studies because uh, this gives you a lot of insight on what's going on out in the field. But unfortunately, this sort of study has a lot of limitations. And the big limitation is you have no control, right? You're not, you cannot change anything in the system. People are running an application, a real application that uh, actually more than a billion of people are using. And you really cannot change, you cannot control. But we wanted to control and understand uh, what happens to the errors essentially. And that's why we built these FPGA-based infrastructures. I don't know Juan may have mentioned them in, in an earlier lecture, uh, but we're gonna go a little bit more deeper into this. And this is an FPGA-based infrastructure where you have FPGAs connected to DRAM, and this is our makeshift infrastructure in 2011 or so. Uh, and the idea is to design a memory controller uh, such that you can change this memory controller, uh, change its parameters, for example, the retention time, refresh rate, et cetera, so that you can see what kind of errors are happening in DRAM and you can understand and pinpoint the reasons for the errors. So you have complete control over the system. And you can see some papers over here. We're going to cover some of those later uh, today and later in, in potentially later lectures. And this is the Rohammer paper we will discuss. And we built up this infrastructure so that you can have many FPGAs, many DRAM chips, better temperature controllers, because temperature is important to examine also, as we will see later on. Uh, and this is a more recent infrastructure. It's called the SoftMC. When we released it, we called it SoftMC eventually in 2017. Uh, and Actually, anyone can download it if people are here are interested in doing research. We do a lot of research in my group using this infrastructure even right now. And we still keep discovering new things about memory, which is also fascinating, I think. Uh, so DRAM was invented in 1965. That's 60 years ago almost, right? By Bob Denard from IBM. And clearly, it has been extremely influential. And you can read the patent on DRAM also. That was published in 1968. Uh, but... It's amazing that so little was really known and published about it until, let's say, the last 10 years, in my opinion. There was, of course, stuff published about it, no question about that, but so little real data uh, on uh, real DRAM chips was published until the last 10 years. That's surprising. I think the reason why uh, the, we're interested in publishing and looking at this real data is because technology scaling is not going well. Because if the technology scaling is going well, maybe, okay, it's not that interesting to look at the data. Uh, you could argue that that's not also correct, but <laughs> as a researcher. But I think it, once technology scaling becomes much more difficult, it's, it becomes a lot more interesting to look at something that's not scaling very well so that you understand the problems and solve the problems. Okay, so this is uh, publicly released. It is a C++ API. And uh, a lot of people in this room actually have been working on it. Where's Atabak? Okay, he's hiding somewhere on Zoom, maybe. <laughs> so Atabark has been developing this infrastructure. He has a better version of it right now. But Girai has worked on this infrastructure a lot also. 
Okay, uh, any questions so far? I've been taking a lot of time. <laughs> no? Okay, I'll keep going then. Yes? Uh, which behavior? Yeah, we will talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's look at the behavior first and then we'll get to it. <laughs> That's a good question, though. It's very stuff here. Can we open some window in the back? I think you will need to get the. Yeah, it's not working. Or there, there's some smell from the outside. Okay, so if you open that, it'll be worse. You think? Yeah, I don't like that smell. Okay. Anyway. Okay. So why did we build this infrastructure? Uh, yeah, if you can get the thing at least, so that we can try to open it, that'd be good. Yeah, I hope I'll survive at, until the end of the lecture without getting high. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so why did we build this infrastructure? Actually, the reason we built this first infrastructure was to really understand the retention time issues in DIA. Remember, I said uh, uh, you have a, a, a cell, uh, the DRAM cell, this capacitor. Basically, this capacitor leaks charge over time. Even if you don't do anything to the cell, this capacitor leaks charge. And... Over time, you lose charge. So you need to refresh the EM cells periodically. We're going to talk about that in later lectures also. Uh, uh, you need to refresh these cells periodically. Now, the problem is, as you reduce the size of the cell, you have less charge stored in the capacitor. So you need to refresh things more frequently. Basically, that's a scaling problem of DRAM, retention time, essentially. As you reduce the size of the cell, retention time reduces, and you need to refresh things more frequently. And we believed at the time that this was... a this was the major scaling, technology scaling issue. It is one of the major technology scaling issues, actually, no question about that. But I believe today, Rowhammer may be equally important and even more important uh, in terms of technology scale. So this is the reason why we want to study. Uh, we want to study data retention in memory, and we want to study the data retention characteristics of different cells in the UN. And we tested the retention time characteristics of different cells. You can do those studies with an FPGA-based infrastructure, right? The FPGA-based memory controller allows you to say, okay, I'm going to turn off refresh. I'm going to see which cells lose data after how many milliseconds. Right? For example, some cells lose data after 64 milliseconds. Some cells lose data after 128 milliseconds. Some cells lose data after one second. Some cells don't lose data even after hundreds of seconds, actually. So there's a variation in the retention time because of the variation in process manufacturing. Uh, because basically we cannot perfectly manufacture everything. We cannot dictate the retention time of the cell. We don't have that much control in our manufacturing. Uh, this is variation, actually. Variation is everywhere, right? If you look at manufacturing, nothing is exactly the same uh, in anything we manufacture, even the simplest things. I think humans are an example, right? We don't clearly manufacture humans, but they're somehow uh, manufactured using DNA, which you learned about yesterday. And those variations enable us to be completely different in many, many different ways. So you can think of these cell level variations also similar to human level variations, right? So basically, you can see that uh, the retention time of DRAM actually looks like this. Uh, some cells retain data for a very small amount of time, 64 to 128 milliseconds, but most of the cells can retain data for more than 256 milliseconds. This is what we discovered by testing a lot of DRAM chips. And why is this interesting? Because uh, at the time, uh, all cells in DRAM are refreshed every 64 milliseconds. Meaning, right now, for example, my phone is refreshing all of its cells every 64 milliseconds, even though I'm not doing anything on my phone. This thing is also doing the same thing. This thing is also doing the same thing. Imagine the energy waste that we have, right? So we wanted to get rid of that energy waste and the performance impact when if, uh, that happens when you're accessing these cells. So if you know this retention time distribution, you can basically design mechanisms that take advantage of it, right? Uh, you can, for example, perhaps eliminate these cells from alloc being allocated and increase your refresh rate to 256 milliseconds. You can design a memory controller that understands the retention times of different cells and refreshes different cells at different frequencies. So there can be many, many ideas that can be enabled. And we actually studied some of those ideas. Now, it turns out it's not as easy as this. Uh, we're going to talk about this actually in a later lecture. It turns out uh, the retention time of a cell is dependent on the location of the cell, but also on the value of the cell as well as the cells around it. Now, this is important because this is because there's charge to charge coupling 
between the cells. The different cells are coupled when they store, uh, for example, when one cell stores charge and the other cell doesn't store charge, there is a higher voltage differential between them. As a result, that cell may leak charge much faster. So the data values affect uh, how much retention time you get in a cell. And one of the worst things is actually this time dependence. Well, maybe time dependence is the right, not the right word, but this is more like quantum-like effects. Basically, randomly, the retention time of, cell of, a uh, of a cell changes. For example, when I test the cell at this point, it can retain data for, I don't know, hundreds of seconds. But when I test it tomorrow, it can retain data for only 64 milliseconds. And this happens randomly. This is a random process. And I, I call it a quantum-like effect. This is called variable retention time. And this makes it very hard to figure out how long a cell will retain data. And we actually spent a lot of effort to really understand this phenomenon and overcome it. I'm going to brush through some papers uh, without going over them. So that's why we built the infrastructure. I want to give you insight as to why this infrastructure is there. That was the purpose, basically, to understand this phenomenon and fix it. Our, our goal was to get rid of refresh as much as possible. That's the worthy goal, actually. So just to give you an idea, today, uh, in, in, in the most common memory technologies, cells are refreshed every 32 milliseconds. So basically, refresh rate is increasing, clearly. Not as fast as we thought, because other things have been employed in systems today. Not systems, DRAM chips. The manufacturers, for example, added error correction codes in DRAM chips that allowed them to not increase the refresh rate as much. And that allowed them also to fix some of these variable retention time issues. So there's a lot of interesting things going on in memory in the last 10 years. If you were taking this course 15 years ago, you would not be learning about these. <laughs> and you, I would be telling you manufacturers don't change anything. But that's not true anymore. Manufacturers actually change a lot of things because they're feeling the heat of these issues. Okay, so basically, that's why, that's why we, uh, uh, we built this infrastructure. And that's why, uh, that enabled us to actually understand what's going on in DM. This is actually the first paper we wrote with the infrastructure. We're going to talk about these hopefully in a later lecture hopefully next week, if we can finish Rohammer today. But at the speed I'm going, I probably we're not going to finish <laughs> Rohammer today. And feel free to ask questions also. Uh, and you can actually enable a lot of other studies, as you can see. Uh, so this study we're going to talk about also enables you to design a DRAM system that can tolerate these variable retention time failures. And there are many, many other interesting things. And these, this keeps going on. And more recently, we've been studying the on die error correction that's implemented by the DRAM manufacturers and how it affects retention times, et cetera. And you can see some of these uh, studies. Okay, I brushed through these, but I'm not gonna talk about this. This was actually one of the earlier lectures that we had in computer architecture. This is 2020, but it's kind of true for 2021 also. Uh, we used to put data retention and memory refresh as one of the earliest lectures. I'm gonna pull it uh, to later, but if you're, if, you're not, if you're impatient, you can actually watch this lecture. Okay, so uh, that's the good thing about building infrastructure, I think. You pay, you pay some cost. Like we, we actually spent one and a half years to build this infrastructure and tune it uh, initially in 2011. Uh, and uh, you pay some cost, but that enables a lot of interesting things that you can do that maybe no one else can do. Uh, some people may not want you to do <laughs> also. That also happens, interestingly. Okay, so uh, while we were doing these studies, we were actually quite into, uh, I will show you later on uh, that we also were doing a lot of studies on flash memory. And flash memory is a very interesting technology as well. And you can build infrastructure very similar to what I showed you uh, for flash memory as well, except it's more difficult to build that infrastructure alone. You need to collaborate with some industry folks who are willing to actually give you some important information to enable you access to how to actually change the parameters of flash memory so that you can actually gain some insight. We're going to talk about that maybe in a later flash memory lecture. But we had a similar infrastructure for flash memory where we were also doing a lot of studies on and testing. And with that infrastructure, we actually saw a lot of read disturbance errors. So whenever you read some row in flash memory, it turns out adjacent rows get bit flips. And this is very common in flash memory, actually. And uh, there are ways to prevent it, and we uh, discuss it in our works that I will mention later on, maybe. But we were also very interested in, okay, can such problems happen in DRAM as well? And uh, together with Intel, we did some studies that basically showed that the answer was yes. You could actually, it's, it's actually even worse in DRAM because you could predictably induce these errors in DRAM memory chips. So if you look at flash memory, you have flash memory, and then you have an SSD controller. 
it's not directly accessible to the program. Whenever you, do, uh, you write a program, you cannot directly access flash memory, right? You cannot do a load store to flash memory. Now, there are people who are trying to change that also. Uh, Forward-looking people, let's not, let me call it that way, researchers. But you cannot, in, in your program, whenever you do a load store, it goes to DRAM directly, right? How do you access flash memory? You need to open a file, and then you need to uh, system does some things internally to map that file to DRAM. And then you write to the file inside the DRAM, and then that, that file location that you wrote to in DRAM gets copied back into flash memory. So system actually hides a lot of things, hides the flash memory from you, essentially, so that you don't do anything bad to the flash memory. That's not the reason, of course, but there, there's, there's a huge latency uh, that you have between flash memory and the uh, processor. And the system does a lot of tasks. So you cannot directly uh, induce any errors in flash memory as far as we know uh, today. Indirectly, potentially, you can, assuming the controller doesn't prevent it. But in DRAM, you do a load and store in your program. And if, if you can actually predictably induce a bit flip, you can actually exercise this in your user-level program, as we will see. So that's why this is actually really important. There's no protection that you have. There's no controller in between your program and DRAM to say, okay, you're not supposed to do that. Or I'm handling some issues over here. So whatever you do, you're not going to induce an error. That's the big difference, basically. And that's a big shift in the mindset. I will argue later on that we will actually need to change that mindset so that you put something in between that fixes that problem. Basically, you cannot directly induce errors in DRAM. That's the idea. Okay, but before we go into that, uh, I've already said this, basically. I've already mentioned this. Let's take a look at why the problem is happening. So now let's, uh, uh, what, what is read disturbance in DRAM? What's the type of read disturbance in DRAM? Basically in DRAM you have a, uh, this is an array of cells. You have many rows. And you've seen this picture earlier before, for example, when you looked at uh, processing using memory, for example, right? You had a bunch of rows. Now we're going to look at those rows again. And if you want to access one row, you apply high voltage to the word line. This is called an activate, activation in DRAM. Now, this high voltage uh, is good. Now you can actually do a read command in DRAM and read the data out of there. Okay, that's good. That's, that's a simple reading mechanism. But let's assume that you actually want to read some other row. You need to first close this row, meaning that you need to apply low voltage to that word line. This is called a precharge in DRAM. We're going to talk about these also a little bit more, even though you saw that earlier, we're going to see more of these. So a precharge closes the row, and it enables you to open another row. Okay, so this is activate precharge uh, pair. Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly, activate precharge, activate precharge, activate precharge, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, it turns out there are some vulnerable cells in physically adjacent row that get flipped, meaning they, they get corrupted, they lose their value. So if their value was one, if they were, in if they were charged, for example, they lose charge so that you cannot read them as a value one as a you read them as value zero. So this is basic data corruption. Does that make sense? Well, the mechanism makes sense, but it shouldn't happen clearly, right? This, is, this, is, this should not happen because uh, clearly uh, the memory, uh, wh whenever you're reading from memory, you should not change anything uh, uh, in memory. And in this case, you're reading or activating a row. Uh, you're not even writing to any place. So basically, this is not uh, specified, and it's clearly an error. And we call this a hammer draw. We call this the victim, these the victim rows. So why is this happening? Uh, so essentially, whenever you act, uh, the cells are too close to each other. Whenever you activate this row, it has some effects on vulnerable cells in adjacent rows that cause a little bit of charge leakage. And those effects we're not going to cover in detail in this course. We're going to draw an abstraction layer. Uh, there are multiple effects that go into it. But it, it's essentially, it accelerates the charge leakage on uh, some of these rows over here. And if you do the hammering again, you leak a little bit of more charge from those vulnerable cells. If you go back to those vulnerable cells, if you do the hammering again and again, and again, every time you do hammering, you leak a little bit of charge from these vulnerable cells. And if you are able to hammer this row enough times before the cells get refreshed, such that these vulnerable cells lose enough charge that they cannot be read reliably as charged anymore, you lose the data value clearly. That's the idea. So I said a bunch of things over here. I said before they can get refreshed, right? Which means that there's a correlation between this and refresh rate now. Now, all of the studies that we did before are actually still extremely useful because we understood refresh really well. Can we actually solve the problem using 
uh, refresh? That's a good question we will discuss. So, okay, we did the tests using our infrastructure and we saw that more than 80% of the chips that were manufactured by three major DI manufacturers are actually vulnerable to this problem. This is 2012, 2013. The paper was published in 2014, but the studies were done all in 2012 and 2013. In fact, the first time the paper was sent to Micro 2013, one conference, it was rejected. We may talk about that later on also. Uh, Okay, uh, so uh, there are also only three major GI manufacturers in the world. Can anybody name them? Say it again. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's good. So you're giving me the processor manufacturer counterparts. <laughs> These are DRAM folks. Unfortunately, none of those processor people do DRAM. <laughs> yes? Okay. Micro, yeah, Samsung, SK, Hynix, and Micro. I mean, it's not that important probably, but <laughs> if you buy DRAM chips, you will figure out that uh, they may come from Samsung, SK, Hynix, and Micro. Yeah, there are three of them essentially. There are some smaller ones also. They're all vulnerable to this effect, actually, smaller ones also. But we tested the three major ones. Okay, so this is actually, we show that this is also a technology scaling problem because older chips are not vulnerable to this problem. So older chips that we tested that were from 2008, 2009, do not basically exhibit these bit flips. And we tried our best in that case. Uh, and I think later works also showed that they do not exhibit bit flips. Uh, so the first chips that we saw these bit flips on were manufactured in 2010. And chips that were manufactured between 2012 and 2013 that we tested were all vulnerable to this, as you can see. Uh, so why is this again a scaling effect? What I, showed, what I said earlier, right? The cells are smaller. They have smaller amount of charge as you go through technology generations uh, and cells are closer to each other. So smaller means there's little charge and you can leak that charge faster and closer means they can disturb each other much more easily because the electrical interference that happens between them is higher because they're much closer to each other. Does that make sense? Okay, so both smaller and closer affects this. So why is this happening? I think I kind of gave you the idea. The cells are not electrically isolated from each other. Access to one cell affects the value in nearby cells due to electrical interference between the cells as well as the wires used for accessing the cells. This is also called cell-to-cell -cell coupling and interference. Uh, and again, I'm, not, I'm going to draw the abstraction level uh, over here. There are a bunch of device level things that we can potentially discuss, but we're not going to discuss them in this course. Since, but you can read uh, some of the papers uh, that I'm going to mention, uh, at least a survey paper that we wrote that mentions some of those device level studies. But I like this uh, abstraction, like when you activate or apply high voltage to a row, an adjacent row slightly gets activated as well. And vulnerable cells in that slightly activated row lose a little bit of charge, as I said earlier. And if row hammer happens enough times, if you do these activations enough times, charge in such cells gets drained. And this should happen before refresh happens, of course. If you do a periodic refresh, then you refresh the cell's charge. Okay, and this has enormous implications in the upper layers of the transformation hierarchies. So if you look at a bit error caused by devices over here, it gets directly exposed to the programming language, right? And then user essentially. So everything over here is exposed because that bit flip directly gets exposed to your program. Now let's take a look at an example program where the bit flip gets exposed. This is a program that we released together with the paper. Uh, you can see that it's very simple. These are user level program. You don't need any kernel privileges for this. Uh, you execute this program and uh, at least this basic version of the program selects addresses X and Y such that they go to the same bank. And it essentially hammers uh, them, meaning it bypasses the caches by flushing X and Y from the caches and avoids row hits to X uh, by reading Y in another row. Because there's a row buffer in DRAM, as you remember, and that row buffer, we need to bypass that. And the way you bypass that is by activating another row in the same bank. Essentially, the program does this, right? And if the, if the bank is vulnerable, if these rows are vulnerable, you get, a bit, you get some bit flips. That's the idea. And I can download this program. I don't know if it still works, actually. Has anyone tested recently? Probably not. Because there is a better program that was written by Google that was inspired by this program. What they did was they basically... Uh, used an observation that we had in our paper that showed that if you choose X and Y, such that only one row is sandwiched between X and Y, you can get much more bit flips and you can get to the bit flips earlier. 
That's the idea. That's called double-sided rope hammer. Double-sided means you're actually hammering a victim rope by sandwiching it from both sides, essentially. And that's Google, I think, has that, has that program on their uh, Google Projects here, has a program on their GitHub. So that's a better program to download and test and see what happens to your computer. It's good to check, right? <laughs> Just save your data somewhere so that you don't corrupt your important whatever, maybe. The probability is low, but who knows? It may happen. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so basically we showed at the time that uh, real systems, actually, you can get errors in real systems, Intel, AMD. There's nothing special about Intel and AMD. Uh, we just had our hands on these uh, systems, uh, and we showed that you can get errors. And don't read too much into uh, this stuff over here. I think all memory controllers today are very capable of inducing these errors. Uh, so all systems are vulnerable in the end. And this, uh, we, we claim that this is a real reliability and security issue. And uh, this is the paper that we're going to discuss a little bit more. Uh, it, it, it appeared in NISCA 2014. And the first sentence we wrote in this paper is that memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system. And access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. And I think this makes a lot of sense, right? You're really isolating. You're not changing the data in one way. Uh, I think this needs to be maintained going into the future. And in the paper, we said that Someone, uh, we actually did a lot of analysis, which we we're going to look at uh, a little bit. But we said that someone can take over your system uh, uh, by taking advantage of these bit flips. Someone can hijack your computer, basically. And while we were looking into it, these folks from Google Project Zero did essentially that. They, they were able to show that they were able to gain kernel privileges by inducing these bit flips. Uh, so this is uh, copied and pasted from their blog post, which I would recommend people to read. They have a Black Hat presentation. Uh, as well. If you take taken digital design and computer architecture, we covered also their attack in the virtual memory uh, lecture, if you remember. I'm not going to cover that at this point, at least the basic idea of their attack. But they, basically, they uh, replicated the problem. They learned about the problem from our work. They replicated the problem. They built two uh, attacks, essentially, uh, to exploit this. One of them is not so interesting, to me at least. It's interesting, but not so interesting. It takes over the Google native client. Uh, the other one is more interesting. It basically induces these bit flips to gain kernel privileges on x 64 Linux as a user level process. Basically, as a user level process, you can become root on Linux, which should not happen clearly, right? And the way it does is it, it induces these bit flips uh, in appropriate places in the page table entries of the process. So it basically figures out where to hammer. It hammers the page table of the entry of the process that points the process on page table. And it hammers this thing in such a way that you can gain write access to your own page table as a user level process. So how many people know about virtual memory? So if you've taken digital design and computer architecture, you have. How many people do not know about virtual memory? OK, a small fraction. So you should learn about virtual memory for sure. <laughs> but virtual memory protects pages. So it's, it's, it, it, one of the functions of virtual memory is protection, basically. It ensures that a program, a user level program, doesn't have access to all parts of memory equally. So for example, as a user level program, I should not have access to kernel data structures that, uh, that essentially uh, govern uh, access to everything, right? I should not be able to modify the kernel and say, oh, I gain access to everything on this computer, right? Assuming I'm not a, uh, I'm not a supervisor, I'm not a, a kernel to begin with. So that's basic, basic protection. And the page, page table based mechanisms are a way of protecting that essentially. Page table says uh, on a page basis or memory region basis, it basically says, oh, you, uh, this, this user level program can access, can, can access or write to this location or can read from this location or cannot read from this location or cannot write to this location. And that's the idea basically. If you're able to change those permissions, you can gain write access to your own page table. Once you gain write access to your own page table, you can basically set everything as writable and readable. So you can gain access to everything on a system. And this could be on a system that, on a remote system as well as we will see. So this is a very clever attack. Of course, it's easier said than done because uh, it's very probabilistic. Uh, you need to know which bits to flip. Uh, you need to be a little bit creative on how to actually get this to work essentially. And that's what their blog post as well as Black Hat presentation is about, which I'm not going to go into. A lot of these attacks require a lot of system level, uh, let's say hacks, if you will, to really make it make them work. 
Okay, so that's uh, uh, this is the really Emerald Hammer vulnerability essentially. It's a security problem because people have shown that you can actually take over the system as we hypothesized, right? And people drew, uh, are drawing pictures like this. I like some of these pictures. People get creative with pictures also, as you can see. I think the name works nicely <laughs> with the pictures. Okay, so one one actually famous hacker on the internet said it's like Rowhammer is like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the vibrations open the door you were after. I think we desperately need that Rowhammer effect in this room right now because the windows are not opening. Did you get a chance to look at it? We really need it because the carbon dioxide level in this room is very high right now. I think ETH is not doing a good job ventilating stuff. I see, I read 1146. Uh, CO2 ppm. <laughs> yeah, I know. But then they should come and fix the uh, carbon dioxide level. Please tell them to come. <laughs> because if they claim there's good ventilation here, it should not be at 1100. <laughs> okay, this is worse than some airplanes, by the way. <laughs> I collect the state on airplanes and it's amazing that some airplanes are much better than others, but this room should be much better than any of the airplanes. Let me put it that way. So I don't think I don't think the air conditioning is working. Yeah, even though they will claim that it's working. <laughs> so that's my prediction. <laughs> okay, so I think this is actually basically uh, uh, I want to open those windows. Let's bang on the walls, All right? And if row hammer effect is true, hopefully one of these windows will, will magically open. So who wants to try that? Nobody. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to take a break because I want to be able to breathe at some point. Uh, but <laughs> basically, uh, so when we wrote the paper, we said that it's a security problem, but it's also a reliable problem, right? It's, um, and, and folks who were first picking up this were folks who were designing memory testing programs. And I will give you a little bit of history. Basically, these folks said that, oh, this phenomenon, we basically added this test because this paper showed that uh, it's a big problem, right? That's basically what they said. And then later, uh, they were contacted uh, by many, many people saying that, oh, we're seeing these uh, errors in this test. That's test 13. That's the roll hammer test, essentially. And uh, they basically say the errors detected during that test 13, albeit exposed only in extreme memory access cases, are most certainly real errors. So they had to say that, oh, these are actually real errors, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting, right? So it's good that people are, uh, so these were the first people who picked up and tried to actually, uh, Memtest is the program that you run once in a while uh, when you actually uh, boot up your computer, for example. Maybe you're not aware, but sometimes the system may be running it also. You can run it yourself as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, okay, I'm not going to cover this part. You can read it on your own. So we, in the paper, we basically said that someone can hijack uh, your system uh, uh, because this data corruption should not happen so people can use this data corruption, right, for many different reasons. Uh, and we said that someone can do a disturbance attack. Uh, but we didn't do that because you cannot do everything in one paper. And also, uh, other people are much better experts in doing that. So other people did it, as you can see. I'll go through a little bit of history of what has been done very quickly. I'm not going to go into the attacks. These are actually beautiful attacks, I think. These folks uh, in 2016 showed that they can gain unrestricted access to systems of website visitors by doing this attack remotely using JavaScript. If you really want to know how to do this, you need to read the paper. It will take some time to dis uh, discuss it. These folks show that in an Android operating system, uh, you could download a program that scans your memory, figures out which parts of your memory are vulnerable to Rowhammer bit flips, and fools the operating system carefully by uh, to allocate a, a page table entry of the program uh, to a location that they know is vulnerable. And this page table entry happens to point to the page table entry of the program, another page ta the, the page table of the program, and they would hammer that location and they would basically gain write access to their own page table. And they would do this deterministically because it turns out the Android operating system, at least at the time, uh, had deterministic memory allocation uh, algorithms and patterns that you can fool this way. I think this is fascinating. Uh, and then other folks show that you could do this through the GPUs much more uh, let's say effectively, because GPUs can uh, have uh, can access uh, memory much faster, if you will. Uh, other folks show that you could actually do this through the remote direct memory access engine. Again, you uh, you you have remote 
you can do remote loads and stores on a different computer, and you can actually hammer that different computer far away. Uh, and then these folks show the same thing, essentially. These folks show that, so there are a lot of interesting things uh, that are shown, I think. These folks show that even though you may not be able to take over a system, you can at least gain access to confidential data that you're not supposed to gain access to. Basically, they essentially show that you could use Rowhammer uh, as a way to break confidentiality. Uh, what does this mean? That you use the Rowhammer as a side channel to leak some information uh, about some location that you're not supposed to have access to. So this is a different type of attack compared to the prior ones, I would say. Uh, this is another different type of attack. More recently, people have shown that you could degrade the accuracy of neural networks. So you may actually have designed a very nice neural network that is making decisions for you. It could be pedestrian detection. Let's pick the, uh, let's say, bad case. Uh, and this neural network may be quite accurate, 90%. I don't think that's good enough, by the way. You really need almost 100% accuracy if you want a neural network like this. But 90% is better than 10%, right, clearly. Although you could argue that once you know that you're 10%, you could flip the prediction. And assuming it's a single bit prediction, you could get 90% again, but it's not a single bit prediction. Uh, but basically, mm, by inducing these row hammer uh, bit flips carefully in a neural network, your accuracy tanks to 10%. Now, that doesn't sound good, right? You've, you put a lot of effort to train your neural network so that it's very accurate. And training actually consumes a lot of energy, takes a lot of time. And then someone comes and does row hammer bit flips, either intentionally or in an attacking way. There's actually a more recent paper that I will mention uh, that talks about some other interesting things also uh, that are not here. There's not here. Okay. So uh, basically, I think this is uh, the problem. Uh, the, all of these attacks, some of them are easy to do, some of them are hard to do, but they degrade the robustness of the system greatly. And you don't want a system where you would be worrying about this, right? Now, you can ask the question, are people doing this right now? I don't know. But do you really want to bet your life on the fact that, on the trust that people are not doing it right now? Probably not. I wouldn't want to uh, take a self-driving car that would potentially be subject to the sort of attack, right? That doesn't sound good. Okay, there's other papers uh, that are interesting, but I'm not going to cover that one. So. And then there's other pictures, not papers. I like this picture also. This could be a problem in itself because you could go crazy because of your bit flips. Or, <laughs> well, bit flips can be happening here or here. And they could either, both of those can go <laughs> get you crazy, frankly. <laughs> and then uh, this could be a solution to Rohammer also, right? I think that's what some people have proposed <laughs> when they're drawing this picture. Okay, uh, I'm going to take a break very soon, but I will mention that... Uh, this paper, we're probably going to assign it. I'm not sure yet, uh, but this is a paper that we were invited to write recently, recently being three years ago now, uh, on uh, the status of Rowhammer. Uh, and we cover a lot of stuff over here. We cover uh, device level issues, uh, circuit level issues, architecture level issues, system level issues, a lot of security uh, issues. Uh, so we basically cover a lot of things about Rowhammer, including solutions. So if you're interested, this is a good way of getting into Rowhammer. What this doesn't cover is really what happened after, to, after this paper was written, basically, which is also a lot, actually, today, as we will see. Okay, I think we should take a break over here. If there's a question, I'll take it right now. Any questions? No? Did I hammer you a lot that there are no questions? Or? Okay, maybe you'll have questions uh, later on. So let's take a break uh, for... I think I'll do 10 minutes. So let's get back at 14.23. Hopefully the air quality situation here will be resolved.
<laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Go, go talk. We go eat with them. As I said. Like, Can you trust us? No. <laughs> so the data says it's not working.
Uh, I'll, I'll handle it, I think. If, if I need help, I'll let you know. Thanks. Is it working? Live stream? I don't, I don't see it, so. You may need help from John or someone. Okay, okay, great. Okay. Well, do people feel better here? Okay, great. And probably, hopefully other people will come from that room. Joel was there, we can take message Joel and they can come. Okay, I feel much more comfortable. This is, this is the beauty of measuring stuff. <laughs> you can see this reads 500 right now, 556 to be specific. When we left that room, it was 1400, which is much higher than, so outside air is usually 400 or 400 to 500. We'd like to be close to that, I think. That's why we've been measuring stuff also, right? And I'll give you a story. I mean, uh, people who build stuff usually are quite, let's say, confident that they're, I don't know what happened here. Usually are quite confident that their stuff works. I don't understand that confidence always. As a scientist, you should always test stuff, right? I think I need help right now. Apparently, I don't know how this works. Ah, new slideshow. Okay. Okay. Now I don't need help. I fixed it. Yeah. Yeah. As a, as a, so uh, uh, I will give you the story about DR manufacturers, but DR manufacturers uh, said, our stuff works. Trust us. And we will see that story. Well, as scientists, what do you do? Well, of course, you don't trust them, right? <laughs> you figure out what is really going on. Uh, this was also my approach uh, to especially lecturing uh, first time when we were coming out of the pandemic. We're still in the pandemic, I think, even though people are trying to downplay it in general. Uh, but at the time uh, in fall 2021, uh, I opened the windows in that room because we had the lectures over there and had good reasoning. And people said, oh, we had a ventilation system. Don't you trust us? Well, I said, of course I don't trust you. Why should I trust you? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I don't trust anything. I measure it. <laughs> And that's the measurement, basically. That's why you need to measure. <laughs> okay, that's a fun story, but unfortunately, that's a fact of life. It's good to measure because, again, you're building trust on some things that are going to be extremely important. Can you really build trust? Uh, I'm not sure. I think there has to be always testing. Okay, let's jump into understanding row hammer. Uh, so this is the first row hammer analysis uh, that we have done, as I mentioned. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail over here. Uh, on what we have found. And you can find a lot with an infrastructure like this. And surprisingly, you can still find a lot more uh, even after 10 years. Uh, and I'm gonna give you some example results over here. These are some studies that we do in the paper, but let's, let's look into several of these. By the way, these lights are also not good. Let me fix this if I can. Otherwise, gear I... Is this better? Is this better or is it too dark? It feels too dark, right? Okay, conference medium light. Yeah, I don't want people to sleep. It'd be good to have questions. What did you use in the previous one? The lecture is bright lights. I guess if I could, I could dim it. Okay, that's maybe a bit better. What do you think? No? How about people in the back? Is it good? Okay. In the back, it's good. So, okay, uh, we studied the difference in terms of the row addresses of uh, victim and aggressor rows. And this is from the perspective of the memory controller. So a memory controller issues an address to row A. Where do you get the bit flips? Is it at row A plus one and minus one or somewhere else? And it turns out most of the time, you get the bit flips in adjacent row addresses from the perspective of the memory controller, A plus one, A minus one. But some of the time, as you can see over here, there are bit flips that you see in non-adjacent row addresses. Now, what does this mean? This is interesting because from whatever we hypothesize uh, in this uh, error mechanism, it's a physical disturbance mechanism. It, has, it should really happen uh, between physically adjacent rows. The victim should be physically adjacent to the aggressor, essentially. But how do you explain this non-adjacent parts then? Any thoughts? Well, this is the difference between physical adjacency and logical adjacency. 
From the perspective of the memory controller, the addresses you see are not physical addresses in DRAM. Internally, the DRAM chip remaps those addresses to some other address space, not all of them, some of them, because it wants to correct some errors. So for example, uh, you hammer row address A, uh, and then there's a physically adjacent row over there. It happens to be remapped to row address A plus, uh, I don't know, seven. Why? Because during testing, the RAM manufacturers discovered that row address A plus one happened to be broken. There was some other fault that they detected, and they remapped that row to some other row, A plus seven. Now, A plus seven is physically adjacent to whatever you're hammering, something like that, basically. Uh, does that make sense? So basically, because of this remapping, some uh, the, the, the addresses that you see in the memory controller doesn't give you the full picture of physical adjacency of addresses inside the DRAM. And this is important uh, because if you want to put a solution in the memory controller, then, the, uh, then basically you don't know which addresses are physically adjacent inside the DRAM chip if you want to solve the problem in the memory controller. So that's the key takeaway over here. So if you want to solve the problem at the memory controller, you need to discover physical adjacency in some different way. Don't trust the addresses that are logical uh, or do something else. I don't know. And we will see that later on. Does that make sense? Any thoughts? Okay, so that's uh, good to look at. The second one is access interval, how frequently you access uh, a particular row. So in the standard, some uh, free, uh, higher than some frequency is not allowed. This is the distance between two row activations, 55 nanoseconds, basically. Below that is not allowed. Now, if you actually increase the distance between two activations of a row, the error rate you can see reduces. And these are the worst chips from different manufacturers. Uh, don't worry about that. But look at the curve over here, exactly. The error rate reduces. And if you want to get rid of all of the errors, you need to increase the distance between two row activations to every 500 nanoseconds. Now, this could be a solution, clearly. Enable DRAM to be accessed less frequently all the time. But this is a bad solution because this reduces your performance in DRAM, right? You're normally capable of accessing rows every 55 nanoseconds. If you actually increase that by 10x, your performance can degrade. We're going to see a more sophisticated solution that takes advantage of this observation and does this selectively, not always. And then third one is refresh interval. We kind of discussed this earlier. Uh, at the time we tested the chips, the refresh interval was 64 milliseconds. Clearly, if you reduce this refresh, if you if you reduce this refresh interval, meaning you refresh more frequently, you reduce the number of activations you can fit within one refresh interval, meaning that number of hammers uh, you can fit within one ref refresh interval is reduced. So you will get fewer errors, as you can see over here. So at the time when we tested the chips, if you, need, if you wanted to get rid of every single error that we observed, you needed to increase the refresh interval by 7x. Well, refresh frequency by 7x. That, that's pretty bad, right? So remember, we built this infrastructure to get rid of refreshes. Our goal was to actually get rid of the refresh problem in DRAM. Clearly, row hammer is another technology scaling problem with DRAM. You can fix it by making refreshes even worse. So that's, I think, very interesting, right? There are two major scaling issues in DRAM, retention time refresh and row hammer. And you can fix one by making the other one much worse, essentially. Clearly, you don't want that. So this is not a great solution in the end. Uh, and uh, I, I should also mention that we did our test with single-sided row hammer. If you make double-sided row hammer, you need to increase the refresh rate even more. Uh, but this data doesn't account for that. So data pattern, we discussed this in, uh, in, in terms of retention times. Data pattern also affects row hammer. Some data patterns cause a lot more charge coupling as a result charge leakage, accelerated charge leakage. So you get a, an order of magnitude more errors with the row stripe error pattern compared to these more solid error patterns that usually lead to less charge coupling between the cells. So if you're an attacker, you would actually try to uh, create this situation, for example, uh, to induce bit flips. Okay, there are other key observations in the paper. I will not go into a lot of detail. I think this paper will be assigned. Did we already assign it in the homework? Probably not. Okay, in the next homework, you will have it as a, either a required reading or uh, a reading that you can do. But it turns out, Retention time and row hammer are two different failure mechanisms. There is not a lot of overlap between the cells that 
lose charge just, be, just because they sit around and lose charge, right? There's a charge leakage mechanism that happens in DRAM. Uh, charge leaks uh, from the resistance capacitance path uh, from the capacitor through the access transistor. That's a mechanism for failure. These are called retention weak cells uh, that are more vulnerable to this failure. But row hammer victim cells, there's not much overlap between them essentially, according to our studies. I think that some of these studies should be repeated uh, today potentially, but these are two different failure mechanisms. Uh, errors are repeatable according to our results. The most, uh, whenever you get a bit flip in a cell, if you can induce a bit flip in a cell, you can do that again, 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 again. And this makes it a real security problem actually. If the errors were not repeatable, you would not be able to say, okay, this location in DRAM is vulnerable to row hammer. I'm gonna cause a targeted bit flip in that location to take over the system. The fact that they're repeatable, you can cause these bit flips again and again, makes this a real security problem. If it were random, then uh, you could potentially make it a security problem, but it's a bit more difficult, let's say. So we also showed that you get as many as four errors per cache line. Uh, this means that uh, simple error correcting code mechanisms are not able to prevent all errors because simple error correcting code mechanisms in DRAM usually detect uh, two errors and correct one error. This is called SECDET, single error correcting, double error detecting. Of course, you could make it stronger, right? You could make it uh, four error correcting, five error detecting type of uh, systems. These are usually based on Hamming codes. Uh, Hamming distance you talked about yesterday, right? And Hamming distance is uh, what led to the design of the Hamming codes by Richard Hamming. We'll talk about that later also pr probably. But basically, simple error correction doesn't work very well. Uh, Simple error correction means that you add some redundancy to every single cache line, granularity, let's say in DRAM, and that redundant bits allow you to fix any bit flips that may happen. Because, you, because of this redundancy, you can reconstruct what the original data was. And if you have one bit flip, you, you're able to reconstruct things. But if you have four bit flips, if your redundancy is not enough, if you didn't have enough redundant bits in your DRAM, you're not able to reconstruct the original data value. That's how error correcting codes normally work. And we will see that this is actually much worse uh, today if we get to it. The cells are affected by two aggressors on the either side. I mentioned this already. This is double-sided hammering, right? You victim, you, you sandwich the victim between two uh, aggressors. Any questions on this? Thoughts? Okay, otherwise we're gonna move, start moving into solutions. So there are a bunch of row hammer characteristics that are inside this paper. I'm not gonna talk about them, hopefully you'll read them. But we will talk about some more recent papers uh, uh, that shows that row hammer is getting much worse. You can see that this is published six years after the first paper. This is published seven years after the first paper and we're gonna see some other characteristics. So it turns out it's good to study these characteristics because once you understand these characteristics, you can develop better solutions. That's good. You can also develop better attacks. So it could work both ways. It could work for the attacker, it could work for the defender. But if you don't have these characteristics out in the open in the public, then attackers can easily figure out these characteristics. So attackers I think have, a, have more motivation to figure out these characteristics and attack. And never underestimate the power of an attacker. Let me put it that way. Okay, there's also more studies. Girai over here has done a lot of studies on this. Do people know you? That's Girai. Yeah. So you know some people who have done some studies here. A lot of people are actually here are involved in these studies. Yes. Is there a question in the back? Somebody was raising hands. I cannot see very well because of this. <laughs> That's the downside of this room. Okay. No questions. Feel free to ask questions. We don't need to finish uh, everything that I have in the slides, frankly. We can spread across the multiple lectures also. Okay. Now let's talk about solutions. Because now that we identified the problem, what's the solution, right? And solutions are actually interesting because there are some chips that, are, that you know are immediately vulnerable in the field, right? You gotta protect them. The question is, how do you protect them? Clearly there are limited possibilities over here because of things that we will discuss. Your memory control is not programmable today. Uh, you don't have a lot of control basically in the systems that are out there. But longer term solutions can be much more intelligent, creative and careful and secure, let's say, because you know the problem exists. Now you can actually construct a solution while manufacturing the DRAM uh, 
And there's a wider range of protection mechanisms over here. And I'm going to talk about some solutions that we proposed early on. We're going to look at some other solutions later on. So let's look at, we, we actually, we actually cover the solution space a lot. We, we proposed seven solutions in the original paper, which is, I think good to do whenever you discover a new problem. One solution is making better DRAM chips. <laughs> now, this is much, much easier said than done. Uh, how do you do this? You can have better materials that isolate rows better from each other. You can put some distance between the rows, isolation uh, techniques. It turns out all of these are very costly as far as we know today. At some point, people may figure out how to do this at low cost, but all of these are very costly. That's why the problem actually happened in the first place. DRAM manufacturers don't know how to fix this by making better DRAM chips. And they are the true experts in this, no question about that. They may not be the true experts in claiming that row hammer is solved, but they are the true experts in making better DRAM chips if they can. Unfortunately, they cannot easily because there's a huge cost problem over here. The second solution is refresh frequently. We saw just now that refresh is bad for performance, power, energy, uh, and also quality of service, as we will discuss later on in lectures. Uh, refreshing everything frequently is not a good solution because that exacerbates everything, right? Right now, my cell phone is losing battery because of its refreshes. If you refreshed it 7x more DRAM, it's not good. In fact, if you remember, if you took digital design and computer architecture, we made you calculate how much power is spent refreshing a one exabyte computer, right? A computer with one exabyte DRAM. That's on the order of kilowatt hours, right? That's huge, basically. It's a waste in the end. So this is not good also. Sophisticated error correction codes, like adding more redundancy to correct errors. Uh, this could potentially correct uh, row hammer, protect against row hammer bit flips securely, but then your cost needs to be very high. So we showed, for example, you, need, you get four errors per cache line. You really need to have uh, uh, or error correcting codes. And this is very costly, actually. The amount of additional bits that you need to add to DRAM just for the purpose of error correction is huge. Uh, like, uh, just to give you an idea, if you want to correct just one error, the amount of additional area that you add to DRAM is 12.5%. Now, if you want to correct four errors, that actually multiplies. That's about four times 12.5 multiply, 50%. That's a lot, basically. And that's not even enough, as we will see. That number actually increases. Of course, you could imagine different ways of organizing the redundancy bits, et cetera. That makes things more complicated. So cost and power, sophisticated ECC, I don't believe is a good solution. Uh, maybe people will come up with better ECCs. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, this is actually interesting because error correcting codes are designed uh, to tolerate errors that we don't know why they're happening. So what you do is you protect your entire memory with additional redundancy, all memory cells equally, normally, and a bit flip happens. You don't know why it's happening. And magically, your error correcting codes correct, correct it. That's good. This gives you protection. So soft errors, for example, when, when particle strikes happen, a, neut a neutron particle, for example, if it strikes your uh, DRAM in space, these error correcting codes are actually really good for those things. But here, we know why the error is happening, right? We exactly know the mechanism. Somebody's hammering some row. So that's why sophisticated ECC is not a good idea in general. But let me tell you a story about, uh, that's the beauty of having these lectures, right? I can tell you stories also uh, about what DM manufacturers uh, claimed. So I gave a, a, a row hammer type of talk in a supercomputing conference in 2015, I believe. I remember it very well in Frankfurt, I think. Uh, I, I, gi I give this talk, I talk about row hammer, and I talk about other things also, like memory-centric computing, saying this is the future of memory, et cetera. And then this uh, senior person from Micron comes up to the stage. His talk is about something else, but he has to rebut what I say, right? <laughs> he felt the need. And the first thing he says is, look, I have a solution for you. This is 2015. Uh, I have a solution for Roham. It's three letters. Can you guess what it is? It's on the slide. <laughs> e C C. Okay, I'll end it here because we will see that that's clearly not a solution. <laughs> but this is why you need to question what's going on, basically. Okay, so the access count is interesting because this is uh, an interesting story. Uh, the idea here is to count or figure out which rows are accessed frequently. Either you do an exact count or an approximate count, 
doesn't matter. Figure out which rows are accessed frequently and refresh the victim rows quickly so that uh, uh, they don't get bit flips or throttle the accesses to the row so that they don't get bit flips. I think this is interesting. In our original paper, we were down on it because this is complex. But I think going forward, this is actually a very interesting solution direction because this problem is not getting easier and we don't know other solution directions. Basically, everything else is, is worse than these access counters today. So we'll, we're going to talk about these access counters a little bit. But before we talk about access counters, we're going to talk about some other solution that is interesting. But before I talk about it, what was implemented by industry. So industry clearly was worried about it, especially after our paper uh, was published. And uh, they basically, uh, this is uh, Apple's security release. You can still find it online, I think. But basically they say, uh, they were actually quite honest. They said, Rowhammer exists and we mitigate this issue by increasing the refresh rates. That's good. They didn't say by how much. <laughs> Probably they increased the refresh rates by 2x, right? That's my guess and that's what I believe. But they were actually at least open and they said this and they basically were nice. They, they cited our paper saying that that led to this uh, issue. Other industry vendors also released similar patches. Uh, so basically increasing the refresh rate was the only option. But clearly they were not, they could not afford increasing the refresh rate by even 4x in my opinion. By even, I mean, 8x would be terrible, right? So this is not a good solution. The reason why this is the only solution out there in industry is because you cannot, you cannot change the memory controller, basically. You cannot patch the memory controller. You cannot employ any of the other solutions. Even if you wanted to employ sophisticated ECC, you could not, because that requires additional hardware, right? And you cannot change the system on the fly unless you create a soft ECC, software-based ECC, which is extremely costly, actually, in terms of performance. You could potentially do that. And access counters, forget about it. You cannot add these. We're going to talk about some software solutions later on also. And maybe you should be thinking about solutions and asking questions too. Okay, so that's what's employed in industry. So our solution was very simple. I still think this is actually a very good basis of a solution, but we will see that this doesn't work uh, as Rohammer gets much worse in existing chips. The basis of the solution is this. It's called probabilistic adjacent row activation. Very simple idea. After you close a row, after the memory controller closes a row, it refreshes one or both of its neighbors with a very low probability, like five out of a thousand times. And you can set this probability at the user level uh, or at the program level or dynamically. And we show that with the row hammer thresholds that we see. Uh, so at the time, uh, what is row hammer threshold? The row hammer threshold is how many activations do you need to make to get a bit flip? And at the time, it was around 100,000. To be specific, it's more 139,000. Uh, but OK, 100,000, let's say. So it is a large value. You cannot get bit flips uh, with small values, basically. And at the time, uh, that this probability works quite well. But as this number reduces, as the number of activations you need to do to get to a bit flip reduces to, let's say, 500, your probability also needs to increase because you need to be uh, protecting uh, against a much smaller activation count. But at the time, this worked quite well, uh, as you will also see in the paper. Uh, in fact, uh, if you're paranoid, you can adjust the value of P and you can vary the strength of protection against errors. And the good thing is this has no hardware cost. Well, no hardware cost in the sense that you don't, you're not tracking anything. You just basically are flipping a coin. It could be deterministic also. You don't even need a random number generator, in my opinion. We'll talk about random number generators later on, uh, in, not today, but later on in later lectures. Uh, essentially, it's low cost and low complexity. And it's also a low power, low performance over it. So everything looked good, basically. And I like this sort of solution, actually. Uh, but unfortunately, in today's row hammer thresholds, it doesn't work very well. But the good thing is, uh, versions of Para are implemented today in some DRAM chips. And it used to be implemented in some memory controllers. I'll show you an example. So the way it's implemented in DRAM chips today, we're going to talk more about it later on also, is uh, there's enough timing slack and refresh parameters that uh, DRAM manufacturers were able to sneak in a row hammer refresh to prevent row hammer uh, uh, to the victim rows uh, in the amount of slack that's available when you're doing re other refreshes. So if you're doing periodic refreshes, uh, DRAM specifies that, oh, you, can, you have this much time to do periodic refreshes. But internally, DRAM doesn't use all of that time. So there's some amount of time left. Oh, DRAM manufacturers said, oh, I can use this time to 
refresh some adjacent, physically adjacent rows, victim rows based. And that's what they did. And we will see some of those solutions because there, some of those are randomness based, para inspired, let's say. But you could also do it in the memory controller. But if you do it in the memory controller, you're back to what I showed you earlier. Do you know the physically adjacent rows? And the answer is you don't. Not all of them, at least, right? Most of them you know, you can guess, but some of them you cannot guess or you need to reverse engineer. So this requires some more transparency from the DRAM to tell the memory controller, memory controller, these are the physically adjacent rows. So whenever you're doing the solution, probabilistically activating some adjacent rows, here, here they are, you know what they are. Okay, so that said, the solution was implemented by Intel, a version of the solution was implemented by Intel. This is their uh, BIOS. You can see that you can pick your row hammer solution. It could be either hardware row hammer protection or 2x refresh. You can see that's 2x, that's not configurable. <laughs> they don't let you make 4x even. It's actually interesting, right? Because the other one's configurable. <laughs> the other one's configurable, you can pick your probability, like every two activations or every four activations. Probably these probabilities are very, very strong. You don't want to refresh every two activations, right? So this was the probability we suggested, right? Somewhere around there. Yeah. Their implementation is a little bit different. It's not exactly what we envisioned, but I think this was a step in the right direction, actually. Uh, so it was good that people were changing memory controllers to fix the issue. Until the uh, manufacturer said, look, we solved the problem, trust us. And we're gonna see that again. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me uh, jump, uh, jump to uh, future. But I think this is an example of intelligent controller. Basically, that's what we argued earlier in the lecture, right? Uh, I mentioned this paper that we wrote in 2013 that argues for a systems architecture perspective. Memory has issues, let's solve them in the system level together with memory. That's an example. This, this controller is somewhat of an example. Not perfect example, but this is an intelligent controller trying to protect some of, uh, against some of those issues. I believe the controls need to be even more intelligent basically to solve these scaling issues. And they're, they're also security, safety, reliability issues. So we want these controllers that can actually enable all of these characteristics for us. Now, let me show you the flash infrastructure that inspired a lot of these studies with DRAM also. This is the flash memory infrastructure. It's again, an FPGA, FPGA based infrastructure. We have flash chips, as you can see, and we can control these flash chips using fine grain commands. And we can again, discover a lot of things in this infrastructure, in, in, in what's going on in term, in, inside the flash chips. And we built this infrastructure before we built uh, our DRAM infrastructure. You can actually see that our first publication uh, with this with, on flash memory infrastructure, its characteristics, et cetera, is earlier than our first publication with DRAM. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm showing you this because these flash memory based solid state drives actually have intelligent controllers. As I said earlier, there is a controller that protects against these reliability issues. And we will talk about that hopefully in a flash memory lecture later on, keep that in mind right now. But if you're impatient, you can actually read this paper that covers a lot of interesting things about what goes on internally in existing flash memory drives. Okay, I'm gonna skip this because you're actually having the detailed lecture on Rowhammer. <laughs> but if you're interested in other lectures, you can find them online also. Uh, so we have written papers, as I said, this is a good overview paper. As I said, it doesn't cover what, uh, uh, what, what was done in 2020 and 2022. That's what we're gonna cover now. But this is a great place to ask questions right now. Yes, please. So that's an outstanding question. Uh, I mean, the answer is really, I don't know <laughs> because I don't have access to their physical models. Uh, if I had, I probably couldn't tell you. <laughs> if I had access, I probably couldn't tell you that also, <laughs> just, to, <laughs> just to confuse you, just like a DM manufacturer would do. But basically I don't know is the uh, summary answer. Uh, do I believe that it could cover those effects, like when you say a physical model is like a circuit level, device level model, that they tweak some things and they see the effects. I believe partially they can based on what they know, uh, but I don't believe that they can fully understand uh, the effects just using the physical models that they develop. They can tune the models, they can try to fit things, but uh, there's, there's something, so there's a physical model and then there's manufacturing, right? Once manufacturing happens, you don't, you cannot exactly model what happened during manufacturing because there's so much variation and you cannot take into account all kinds of variation. 
as far as we know. So I believe there is a disparity between the physical model and the uh, uh, manu real manufactured device. So a lot of our results are actually sometimes useful and surprising to the AI manufacturers also because we show them something that they didn't know based on our interactions. So I don't believe their physical models completely cover things. And I think it's very difficult also. Yeah. I'll give you an example. Even uh, in, uh, hopefully we'll have a simulation lecture in this class, but uh, okay, you build a CPU, forget about DRAM. You build a processor. Normally what you do is you have a very log, low level, very low level model, right? Gate level model of uh, the CPU. And then you manufacture the CPU. Usually there's some discrepancy. In this gate level model, gate level model doesn't com completely correspond uh, to uh, what happens in the CPU. It's off by, I don't know, five to 10% sometimes uh, in terms of energy estimates, performance estimates. Uh, so you would expect this very log model would perfectly correspond, right? Because this is what you should, you're supposed to manufacture, implement. Uh, but there's so much, again, variation and things that happen in the design that that very log model doesn't perfectly match. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think modeling is a good direction, but I believe it's, uh, we can always make it more accurate, but it's going to be difficult to get a perfect model. That's why I think doing real device experiments helps a lot. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ECC can cover. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Uh, basically, you're, you're suggesting combining two different solutions, right? Don't, uh, yeah, we combine refresh and ECC. And that makes sense, but then it's still costly. <laughs> yeah, I think the cost is still there because yes, your ECC can be less strong. Your refresh can be less strong also, let's say, uh, but it will still cost you and it will uh, have performance overhead. So uh, ideally you would like less over, uh, solutions with less overhead in the end. And also you mentioned something probabilistic, right? Uh, the question is, is that the kind of guarantee we want or do you want deterministic guarantees that this will never happen? That's another question, right? Do you wanna really risk <laughs> some probability? I think that's independent of uh, refresh plus ECC. That's really a solution uh, direction. I, I believe in the end, you really want to not risk things. Depends on the probability, of course, right? Everything in the world is probabilistic in the end. Even deterministic things are probabilistic, I would argue. <laughs> Now we're maybe we can guts go, go into the guts of quantum uh, mechanics and stuff, but really uh, a deterministic solution is deterministic based on what you know, right? Uh, it may not be deterministic if, for example, uh, the system doesn't behave in the operating conditions that you expect it to behave, right? For example, you set your deterministic solution. We will see a deterministic solution called Blockheimer, developed by Girai over here. That works assuming you set the row hammer threshold correctly, right? But if your row hammer threshold is actually different or lower, the row hammer threshold is how many activations you need to do to get a bit flip. If for some reason in some operating condition, you get a row hammer threshold that's lower than that, now your deterministic solution becomes probabilistic. Right? So a deterministic solution assumes that you know essentially everything about the system that will affect your solution. But unfortunately, I don't think we have that luxury today in our systems. So as a, from a purist perspective, calling the uh, solutions deterministic assumes some things basically. So I like your, I think, thinking, make it probabilistic and make the probability extremely low. <laughs> I think that's, a, that's, not, that's not a bad direction actually. Any other questions? Okay. So let's talk about what happened in 2020 and 2022. Uh, well, it's still happening actually. Uh, I think a lot of interesting things happened, right? I told you this Intel solution and then DRM manufacturers saying, 
oh, we fixed the problem intellectually, stopped using the solution after that. Even Intel believed the DI manufacturers, let me put it that way. But the question is what really happened? So uh, I'm gonna first uh, show some results from uh, device level. Basically, we were also interested in what's happening to Rollhammer basically. DI manufacturers are claiming they fixed the problem. Can they really fix the problem easily? Uh, let's do a study that uh, spans many, many generations of DRAM and take a look at what's going on with the Rollhammer really. Is it really easy to fix? And this paper shows that Rollhammer is getting much worse and it's not easy to fix. Basically, anyone who claims that they fixed the problem, they should really show that they have truly fixed the problem. That's another interpretation. So let's take a look at this. Basically, we uh, here we, uh, let's say, uh, ramped up our infrastructure and we actually tested more than 1,500 chips and we showed, these are the key takeaways. Uh, I'm gonna show you some results also, but these, are, these key takeaways will not change. Essentially, newer DRAM chips are much more vulnerable to roll hammer. You get more bit flips and they're happening earlier, meaning fewer activation counts are leading to bit flips. And that's the number. There are some new chips whose weakest cells fail only after 4,800 double-sided hammers. So it's like really 9,600 activations total. That's an order of magnitude lower than the 139,000 that we showed in 2012 or so. So within the course of seven or eight years, the number of activations has reduced by an order of magnitude in, in order to induce a bit flip. Now, this doesn't sound very good clearly, right? Now, some attacker can much more easily induce these bit flips. And this also shows that this is a technology scaling problem because, because the cells are smaller and closer to each other. As a result, you're getting these bit flips are much, uh, much earlier as the technology scales, cells become smaller and closer. Uh, I had some more thing to say, but I forgot. Okay, and then we also showed that uh, basically the problem is getting worse in general. It's affecting more rows, not just the physically adjacent rows. And uh, yeah, it's affecting more rows and far away from the victim row. And the last takeaway in red over here, existing mitigation mechanisms are not effective if this keeps going on. Basically, if this scaling trend goes further, let's say you go down to 480 double-sided hammers, which is about 1,000 activations, existing solutions that are proposed are not going to work well. They're either going to not work or they're going to induce significant performance and energy overheads. That's the other finding from this paper. And because of these findings, actually industry said, okay, what's going on? <laughs> we should really fix this problem basically. And this was motivated by not directly DI manufacturers. It was really motivated by big companies like Microsoft, Google saying, we really need to solve this problem. <laughs> So they actually pushed the manufacturers and the community, uh, the industry community, I should say, to form working groups in the standards body so that they can actually fix this problem for good. We'll see if it's going to be fixed for good. Probably not. <laughs> okay. So to, to be able to do these studies, we actually had multiple infrastructures. Uh, these are soft MC based infrastructure and this is an in-house infrastructure. So we wanted to test different types of DM also. These are different DM protocols. We don't need to know about them at this point, but we'll cover them at some point. LP is, for example, low power DDR. Uh, your phones have low power DDR. DDR4 is a new version of DDR3. These are different protocols, essentially. But they're essentially the same in terms of the DM design internally. And we essentially built a lot more infrastructure. This also took some time. And we tested a lot of chips from older generations of each uh, DM type and newer generations of each DM type, as you can see. I'm not going to go through all of these details. You can read this paper also. But basically, it's a big scaling study. Our goal was to really understand what's happening with technology scaling. And it's always good to be able to do these studies, I think. Also, once in a while, because you may discover some things that are not known. Or even if you discover some, even if you find something that's known, that's useful data for the community. So that's useful science in the end. But we discovered something that's, I think, interesting. So I, I already said this, but uh, when you go from older technology to newer technology, roll hammer bit flip rates increase. So you can see that what, what we're plotting here is three different manufacturers. Uh, and these are all the chips, I believe, that are tested uh, with different manufacturers. And you can see the curve over here. This curve shows the hammer count and the bit flip rate you get at each hammer count. Uh, hammer counts how many times you hammer in a double-sided manner. And you can see that the curve is shifting to the left and higher, upper, which means that bit flip rates are increasing and hammer counts are reducing. Hammer counts to induce the bit flips are reducing. And this is a general trend across all manufacturers, as you can see, across many chips. 
So this is a, this is a scaling study, as I said, this, and this is a perfect example of a scaling result. So that's the take, key takeaway. Rolfheimer vulnerability increases with technology node generation. It's hard to argue with data, as you can see, right? Yeah, manufacturers can say, we're making our chips better, but you measure and say, oh no. <laughs> And okay, uh, I should also not be uh, maybe too harsh on manufacturers because DM manufacturers actually, I believe, did make their chips better. Some of the things have improved. I believe they have, uh, I believe they're increasingly better at isolating the row hammer effect to a single row uh, that is surrounding one aggressor row. I think we need to test that more, by the way. <laughs> but I believe that. <laughs> uh, I believe they have done some circuit and device level things to actually improve. Otherwise, things would be much worse, in my opinion. So they're doing some things, but they cannot do enough because this is such a fundamental scaling problem. Okay, this is another example. I will not uh, throw you a lot of data, but this shows that uh, in, in going from older to newer technology nodes, the number of hammers that you need to do for, to induce the first bit flip reduces significantly. And sometimes we don't have data, but ignore that. Sometimes we have some anomalies. That's because we cannot label things correctly. But essentially, the trend is very clear. Newer technology generations uh, experience bit flips much earlier. And if you want to look at the numbers, these are the numbers. So this is the 4.8K number. OK, now let's take a look at solutions. So everything I showed is real data, but you also need to simulate. As good architects, uh, you should be able to do both, in my opinion. Gather data from real systems and it changed real system, but also simulate what will happen in the future, right? Architects, we're, we're looking into the future. So what we do in this paper work is we study five state-of-the-art mitigation mechanisms, increasing refresh rates, uh, para we discussed. I'm not going to talk about these, but these are based on access counters. Actually, twice is based on access counters. I think MR lock is based on a different version of para combined with access counters or something like that, I forget. But there are some state-of-the-art at the time. And we also look at one ideal refresh-based mechanism, which I will describe. And you can read the paper for more. And this is, these are some results. So this is basically the hammer count, number of hammers required to induce the first row of hammer bit flip. That's a beautiful graph, by the way, when you're presenting something like this. Uh, I like this graph. Jeremy did this graph. He was my PhD student. Uh, he won the best dissertation award in uh, European Design Automation Conference. Uh, but uh, you can see that uh, this is the hammer count, number of hammers required to induce first row of hammer bit flip. And this is a normalized system performance that you get. 100 is no performance loss. 100% is as if you didn't have any mitigation mechanism. Uh, ideally, you would be at 100, right? That's our goal. This ideal thing over there is a mechanism that issues a refresh command to a row only right before the row can potentially experience a row hammer bit flip. So only before you can get a bit flip, you issue this refresh. This is an ideal mechanism. There could be even more ideal mechanisms that doesn't per, per row basis, but let's not talk about it. But you can see that as hammer count reduces, this ideal mechanism also loses performance. Even the ideal mechanism has a 6% performance gap at this value. I think this value is 64. I don't remember. 64, basically 64 activations. Uh, well, 6% is actually here. I don't know. This is maybe this may be 128. I don't remember, frankly. Basically, at 128 hammer count, you get 6% performance loss. So if this problem gets much worse, if it reduces, basically, if row hammer becomes worse, an order of magnitude again within eight years, you will be at this operating point. An ideal mechanism, even ideal mechanism, leads to 6% performance loss. Now, let's take a look at real mechanisms. Uh, well, this is where we are, actually, based on our testing. It's about, uh, yeah, 4,800. So real mechanisms are not bad today, as you can see, today being 2020. Uh, para loses performance, as you can see, 8%. You could argue that it's still not that great, even at that operating point. But some other mechanisms are actually quite good. But uh, as you go into the future, para's design scales. It still works, but it's terrible in terms of performance, as you can see. So at this point, it loses 80% of the performance. That's not good, right? I think GRI's results recently also have been showing the same thing, right? Or something similar in the end. So ideal mechanism is significantly better, basically. So essentially, this paper showed that existing mechanisms are not doing well. Para is the only scalable mechanism. The other ones are very difficult to scale, and they become extremely hardware costly. Some of them we didn't know even how to scale at that time. 
And even the ideal mechanism is losing performance, but there's a huge gap between ideal mechanism and uh, existing scalable mechanisms. So this paper also inspired a lot of solutions going forward. A lot of people started looking into Rohammer and tried to solve the problem uh, based on these results. So, and that's the work. That's, so it's good to revisit it after eight years, as you can see. Any questions? Yes, please. Uh -huh. yeah hmm. yeah yeah i mean that's all that's that's always something that people propose but number of channels is not cheap <laughs> it's actually potentially more expensive uh, the reason is uh, when you actually uh, add more channels you're adding pins to the processor and we already almost processor uh, pin limited in existing processors yeah, there's no good solution, unfortunately. So if you really want capacity, you really need denser chips. Or you go 3D stacking. And 3D stacking is also interesting. We kind of discussed this in earlier lectures from the perspective of processing in memory. But it also gives you density. But again, you're limited by how much you can stack over there. Yeah. <laughs> good question, basically. <laughs> and some people suggested, OK, let's stop making denser chips without even suggesting that, oh, you add more channels. <laughs> they don't want to even, <laughs> basically, they, they, they don't want progress, let's say. <laughs> Let me put it that way. So uh, let's stop making uh, denser chips without coming up with some alternative of increasing capacity. I believe that's no progress at this point. I think clearly we need denser chips to uh, house the data that we have. We already have a huge problem with data, as we discussed in earlier lectures. Right? So I like your thinking. Let's. It's not just let's stop making denser chips, but let's try to overcome that in some other way. But that some other way always tends to be very expensive in some, in some different way than, uh, than the denser chips provide. But it's still good to keep thinking of that. It could be some other technology also, right? Let's stop making denser DM augmented with some other technology. We're going to see that with emerging memory technologies later on in lectures. I think that's also a viable and, in fact, potentially uh, use, uh, potentially. Uh, uh, feasible direction, but then it requires a lot of time right, to develop that other technology that can get danced. And usually other technologies have problems as well. We will discuss that in emerging memory technologies. That's a fascinating area too. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let me move on. So this is one work in 2020. As I said, DI manufacturers and well, there's a, there's a detailed lecture on this actually. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but we used to have more detailed lectures on this in earlier incarnations of this course. I'm not going to go into more detail about each of these papers because we'll cover other materials in this incarnation of this course. Uh, so let me talk about, uh, so as I said, DI manufacturers said we solved the problem and we took this as a challenge. Of course, DI manufacturers did not directly challenge us. They challenged the entire world, right? Saying, by saying that. We solved the problem. We don't, we're not going to tell you how, but trust us. Right? And these are very public statements, actually. You can find them online easily. And we basically said, OK, let's take a look. Is that true? Because if it's true, that's great. If it's not true, not so great, clearly. right? So here, you, we cannot lose, basically. <laughs> if we find that it's true, that's good. Well, good for DM manufacturers also. But if it's not true, then there's a big problem. right? And that's what we discovered. Basically, we discovered that it's not true. Uh, so uh, this is the first work to show that uh, protected DRAM chips, row hammer protected DRAM chips are actually not protected basically, despite the claims. Uh, so we call trespass because TRR is the mechanism that was introduced uh, by the DRAM manufacturer. It's called target row refresh. Uh, it's a very generic mechanism. They don't tell you how it works, but they basically tell you that uh, there is potential in the memory controller so that you can refresh the target rows. That's it. It could be done in the memory controller. It could be done inside the DRAM chip also. Intel, Intel's version is called PTR, probabilistic TR that was in the memory controller. But inside the DRAM chip, there's some target row refresh that can happen. But there is not much information about it. It's actually mysterious. Uh, so this work showed that uh, internally, you can reverse engineer how this works briefly and bypass these mechanisms. So internally, how these mechanisms work is they have some tables or they have some sampling mechanism. They sample some rows. And they keep track of accesses to those rows. And it turns out these tables are not large enough to ensure that they keep track of everything that's needed to prevent row hammer bit flips. 
So what we did in this work is to overflow these tables so that they cannot track a row hammer pattern. As a result, you can induce bit flips. That's the basic idea. It's very simple. The question is, of course, how do you overflow those tables? You need some insight into what's going on in the underlying mechanism. How do you gather that insight? Well, our FPGA-based infrastructure, the soft MC infrastructure, right? That enables us to figure out what's going on in the DRAM chip just enough so that we can craft an access pattern that induces these bit flips. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail over here, but we can basically partially reverse engineer the mechanisms implemented in DRAM chips and memory controllers. And there's also an automatic tool that can effectively create many side row hammer attacks and real chips. So let's take a look at these hammering patterns. So for example, uh, this is, uh, ignore this bottom part over here. Over here, uh, this is a double-sided row hammer, right? You, the red ones are the attack, attacker rows, aggressor rows. The blue ones are the victim rows. And this is double-sided row hammer. This is the real victim row. And these are the, let's say, weaker victim rows. Uh, if your tracker is tracking only two rows internally and looking at access counts, if you have a third one over here, you're overflowing the table, right? That tracker, that internal tracker inside the DRAM chip would not be tracking that. So this potentially can overcome some internal tracking mechanism. But this may not be enough, depending on the size of the tracker. Uh, maybe you need a four-sided attack, right? Four-sided row hammer. So we show in the paper that as many as 19-sided row hammer is useful to increase the bit flips. So for example, these are real results uh, using our FPGA infrastructure again. These are the bit flips you get. Now, how many aggressor rows do you hammer? Five of them in this particular case, and you get some bit flips as you can see. If you hammer be uh, below four, you don't get bit flips because you're not overflowing this internal table. Here, you need to be even more aggressive. Basically, you need to hammer, I think, nine rows at least. If you hammer anything below eight, you don't get bit flips. And we can discuss the shape of the curve, et cetera. This is, there's some noise in the system, but let's not do that right now. But if you're interested, you can read the paper. It's fascinating, actually. So this infrastructure has enabled us to figure out really what's going on and uh, uh, hammer the right amount of rows to induce these bit flips. OK, that's why I put the infrastructure over here. Let me give you a little bit more information. Basically, in this paper, we developed some understanding of the internals of the RAM chips. Basically, these it's called tracker or sampler, but these are uh, the sampler. There, there are two components of NDM row hammer protection mechanism sampler and inhibitor. Sampler tracks the aggressor row activations using different techniques. It could be based on every, uh, how do you sample basically? Do you sample every nth row activation? Or do you record first n row activations? Or do you do it randomly, just like Para would potentially do, right? So there are a bunch of design options here. Regardless of this, the sampler has a limited size. It doesn't matter what design option you choose, you have a limited size and you can exploit that limited size to overflow the tables. Inhibitor on the other hand is, figures out which rows are activated a lot using the sampler and prevents bit flip by refreshing the victim rows. And here, as I said earlier, the latency of performing the victim row refreshes is squeezed into slack time available in the refresh time. So there's a refresh time, there's a latency of regular refresh command, but there's a lot of slack that DM manufacturers use. They play a lot of tricks internally actually to do the refresh. Uh, so you, they don't need the exact refresh time that is in the standard. So the way the memory, memory works today is there's a standard document that says, this is the refresh time. Once the memory controller issues a refresh, it cannot issue anything to this bank or rank because we're going to assume that the memory, uh, DRAM is doing refresh. But internally, DRAM is not doing refresh all the time because DRAM manufacturers have optimized this and they figured out, okay, I have some more time over here. I'm going to do row hammer refreshes, basically, target row refreshes. So that's what they do internally. And these are our observation, basically. I, again, maybe I, I will not go into detail, but basically uh, the key here is this TRR, target row refresh, is triggered on every refresh command and it exploits the slack and refresh. And you can sample more than one aggressor. Uh, the mitigation can refresh only a single victim within a refresh operation. And by sweeping the number of refresh operations and aggressor rows while hammering, we can figure out the sampler size. I will let you read the paper to really understand this. But basically, by, by discovering these and validating all of these observations using the FPGA-based infrastructure, you can figure out the sampler size. Later, I'm going to show you a much better method to reverse engineer. 
So by doing this, you can actually craft these access patterns. And these access patterns, you can see these are the uh, DRAM modules that we tested. I think we tested 42. We've, we were able to induce bit flips on only 13. That's still a big number, on, uh, uh, basically on three di different DRAM manufacturers, because these are claimed to be Rob Hammer free, right? You should not be able to induce bit flips on any of them. It should be zero out of 42, not 13 out of 42. And you can see some numbers over here. That's the best pattern, for example, for this manufacturer. Uh, for, for different DRAM modules, you have different best patterns, if you will, because their design is slightly different, actually. And we will see that also. Yeah. So some of them actually are vulnerable to three-sided bit flips, uh, three-sided hammers. Some of them are vulnerable to 19-sided, as you can see. So it really depends on the DRAM chip. So uh, the takeaway is that uh, you can actually bypass these mechanisms. It's a bit harder. It's not as easy as inducing bit flips in a chip that's not protected. Now it's a bit harder. You need to do, as an attacker, you need to do more work, right? But a motivated attacker can do more work, right? We were just uh, academics doing this work, right? Now imagine people who are much more motivated to take over some critical data. It's not hard, let's say. And we also showed that the end-to-end -end systems use, uh, collaborating with security researchers, Kava Razavi, uh, here uh, right now at ETH, actually, uh, uh, we showed that real phones, you can actually uh, induce bit flips on real phones. You can find patterns. And also you can induce some att real attacks at small amount of time. These are different types of row hammer attacks that were proposed in the field. You can read the paper for, paper for each of them. PT attack is essentially what we discussed with the uh, Google attack, right? Page table entries. You handle the page table entries and you gain root privileges, but there are also encryption attacks on encryption keys that allow you to discover a private key, right? Like uh, cryptographic algorithms that we use today require that your private key is not discoverable. But people have shown that by inducing bit flips the right way, you can actually recover the private keys and essentially break cryptography. But that's another type of attack that we didn't discuss that I didn't also show. Because these were actually well known even before Rohammer. There, were, there are papers from 1990s that show that if you induce bit flips in the right places, your cryptographic algorithms are actually not secure. And Rohammer is a very convenient way of inducing bit flips at the right places, actually. Uh, but you can see that some attacks are very quick. Like in 2.3 seconds, I think you get the first exploitable uh, template. OK, but you can read the paper. So these are the key results as a summary. Uh, essentially, the claim. Uh, that existing chips are rope hammer free is not true. Uh, and chips are vulnerable, mobile phones are vulnerable. And these results are actually scratching the surface. Our tool is really not exhaustive, right? We really just did just enough to convince ourselves and everybody else, let's say, that you can actually do this. If you actually want to do this more comprehensive, you can take this tool and make it more comprehensive. So some attacker can be doing that, but it's not. It's not that interesting to me as a researcher, right? Why would I make that tool that comprehensive? I, I proved my point. Does that make sense? But basically, the key takeaway is these tools are not that hard to build. People can be building these tools. And there are later tools actually built by Kave Razavi's group called Blacksmith. I will mention that. That are actually much better than a uh, trespass tool that we released. Okay, so the key takeaway is clearly Rolf Hammer is still an open problem and security by obscurity is not a good solution. What does this mean? Basically, DRAM manufacturers, when they were saying DRAM, uh, we protected DRAM, everything is Rohammer hammer free, <clears throat> trust us, they were resorting to security by obscurity, right? as opposed to, here's our solution, here's our algorithm, it's out in the open, break it. Right? That's a very different mindset in security. And I think that's a much better mindset if we can be more open. Otherwise, you have to be, be obscure. And if you're not perfectly secure, someone will actually figure out what's going on. In the end, it's not that hard. If they have the right infrastructure, it's not that hard. If you did not have the SoftMC infrastructure, this would be a whole lot harder, actually. So that's the beauty of building infrastructure and keeping it. OK. So there's a more detailed lecture on trespass if you're interested. Any questions on this? Anybody excited about doing real row hammer attacks now? You can. It's not, <laughs> it's not that hard. Atabak can tell you about that. <laughs> Not that hard. There you go. <laughs> Hopefully, it's even easier than we anticipated. 
Okay, <laughs> he's onto something. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see how much time do we have. Well, I'm running much later than expected, but it's good. We're covering a lot of things. Normally, I finish all of these slides in one hour. When I give this lecture in a uh, like a school, which I've done actually many times over the course of the last few weeks, but again, that's a different setting. So feel free to ask questions. I don't want to. I think it's good that we discuss, uh, ask questions, and maybe develop solutions. Right? You may be the, you may be the one solving row hammer into the future. Don't underestimate yourself. <laughs> now we need solutions. You know, this is, uh, this is a problem. Actually, we believed this problem was big. But I never anticipate this problem was this big. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I believe this actual problem is actually much bigger than uh, at least I thought uh, it would be. OK, let me give you some more uh, results. And then we're going to talk about solutions uh, if we have time. Otherwise, we'll spill over to the next lecture. So this is an interesting question. You, you're given a DRAM chip. How do you guarantee that it's row hammer free? Now, you can, uh, you can plug it into our SoftMC infrastructure and do the testing and try to answer this question. The question is, can you really answer this question definitively? I don't know. I don't know the answer. Does Girai know the answer? Not clear. So nobody knows the answer. Basically, I think this is a very tough question to answer. Uh, so this is a tough question to answer even if you're given an infrastructure like SoftMC. This is an even tougher question to answer if you're not given an infrastructure like that, but you're using a CPU to induce row hammer bit flips, for example, because you have much less visibility into the memory control, much less control. That's what we did with Microsoft. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but we actually did a lot of work. Uh, two of my students went on an internship uh, at Microsoft Research and built infrastructure to test real systems uh, and uh, real servers that are employed at Microsoft Azure. And we wanted to understand, can we guarantee uh, that these systems are not vulnerable to row hammer? And this paper actually develops a methodology and also provides a lot of results. Uh, for example, some of the results show what instructions, instruction patterns do you use to induce row hammer bit flips? What is the effect, et cetera? In the end, it's good to look at this, but we don't know how to actually assure uh, that uh, a DRAM chip is row hammer free. And this is worrying cloud, cloud, uh, cloud uh, uh, system providers, for example, because someone can actually uh, put row hammer attacks in their cloud. So Microsoft Azure is definitely quite worried about it. And other people are also, not just Microsoft. OK, but if you're interested, you can take a look at it. So that was one minute explanation of two years of work. <laughs> now let's move on. <laughs> so uh, we also wanted to uh, understand really what's going on inside the DRAM chips to really show that Rohammer is much worse and uh, security uh, solutions that are not fully secure are not, should not be employed. So we built on trespass work for this one. And the idea was to really develop a methodology that enables us to bypass any protection technique that's implemented inside DRAM chips. And the result is that yeah, uh, we can do that. Basically, you can see that industry adopt solutions are very poor. That's a provocative title, but that's true in the end. You can develop a methodology uh, to cause bit flips in any of the DRAM chips that we tested. And if you work harder, in my opinion, uh, meaning spend more time, you can break any chip with using this methodology. And so uh, I'm going to mention that uh, what the methodology is. But basically, using this methodology, we show that all 45 modules we test are vulnerable. And more than 99.9% .9 of the rows in a DRAM bank experience at least one row hammer bit flip. That's a lot. And then up to seven row hammer bit flips in an eight byte data word. So as ECC is even worse. So you can see that seven. Seven is a larger number than four we discussed. So now your ECC needs to be even stronger in newer DRAM chips. So basically, the problem is getting worse. And these are chips that are supposed to be protected with DRAM. So the hope is that the sort of studies can actually develop, uh, enable the development of more secure row hammer protection mechanisms. But they can also help new row hammer attacks. As I said, more understanding helps the attacker as well as the defender. So what is the key insight over here? So what is the key insight of this methodology? And here, uh, a lot of the expertise that we developed over data retention in DRAM comes into play. And Hassan did a lot of these studies. Why is this moving? Sometimes it plays on its own, and I, I really don't like that, but maybe I press something. Let's see. So the basic idea is to use data retention failures as a side channel to detect when a row is refreshed by the internal 
DRAM protection mechanism, internal row hammer protection mechanism. What does this mean? This means that uh, you, you profile the DRAM retention time of rows. Some rows, you know that they're not going to retain data for long, uh, for, uh, you know that they're, going, they're not going to retain data for long. Uh, so they should get a refresh uh, to be able to retain data. Uh, but uh, the way, uh, so uh, uh, normally they should not get the refresh because we turn, on, turn off the refresh in our study. We turn off the refresh, but if they still retain data, even if we turn off the refresh, it turns out there might be some other refresh going on. Right? So what is that refresh? That refresh turns out to come from the, uh, uh, the uh, NDRAM TRR protection mechanism. And of course, to be able to do that, you need to hammer an adjacent row and induce, or at least try to trigger that internal refresh. And if you see that internal refresh, now you can say, okay, this internal refresh got triggered and I kept the data in the row that is not supposed to keep the data because I know that its retention time is not long enough, right? So that's the idea over here. That's the beauty of understanding what's going on in the ERM basically. You can use uh, the data retention failure or the lack of them as a side channel to detect whether a row is refreshed by an internal mechanism. And by playing with different parameters, you can figure out when a DRAM ship is refreshing internally different rows. It requires some effort, no question about that. It's a lot of manual work, but you can do it, as Hassan showed. And this is the infrastructure. And basically, we were able to circumvent all of the uh, uh, TRR mechanisms internally in DRAM chips. And you can see this is a table that shows manufacturers ABC. You can see that we actually reverse engineered much better what they employ. For example, uh, manufacturer A employs counter-based mechanisms, access counters, and they can count accesses to 16 rows in all of these modules. It's per bank. This, this mechanism is per bank. Uh, this is going by itself, I think. Okay, I have to fix it, sorry. This may give you some time also. Uh, this is the problem. Okay, so you can see that different manufacturers employ different mechanisms. For example, this manufacturer refreshes four neighbors, not just two neighbors, not just two adjacent ones, but they're, they're worried about apparently uh, this row hammer effect spanning more rows than just the physically adjacent rows. Uh, this manufacturer has an aggressive capacity of one. It's sampling based. It's probabilistic, essentially. It's not per bank, but it's not true for all of the modules from this manufacturer. So basically you can figure out what's going on in, in every module. And then there's a TR to a refresh ratio, which, is, which basically says which refresh commands or at what frequency they induce these internal uh, row hammer refreshes. And then you can see this manufacturer is a bit of a mix. It's counter-based as well as sampling-based. As a result, it's a bit more difficult to discover what's going on. If we had more time, we would actually put more time. But at some point, uh, we're not that interested in exactly figuring out what's going on, right? So that's why some of the things that we left unknown. But people can figure this out, I believe. It's not that hard. But at some point, it becomes less interesting, right? Uh, our goal is really not to uh, create an attack and make it available to everyone so that they can actually do this. Our goal is really to show the insights of what's going on, that this is doable, and people need to fix the problem. So you can actually see a lot of interesting data over here. And in the end, a, a large fraction of the DRAM rows are vulnerable over here. I believe you can also increase this by understanding the more detail, more minute details of the mechanisms. Uh, and getting rid of them, these unknowns, for example. And it can get significant bit flips per row per hammer. So these are some interesting results if you're interested in looking at, but the paper has them. Okay, these are some repeated ones. This is the interesting one. I, uh, well, this is one of the interesting ones. Basically, ECC cannot prevent all of the errors. So basically, ECC needs to be, as, as row hammer problem gets worse, error correcting codes need to become even stronger as you can see, right? The number was four in our original paper. Here, the number is seven. You need to protect against seven bit flips. That's a lot. Just to give you an idea, it's actually flash memory uh, today protects a lot of, uh, against a lot of bit flips. Uh, so they employ ECC because they get a lot of random errors. Uh, they go up to, I think, maybe 6,428 today. They can, they can correct that number of bits in, internally. And it's also getting worse. Uh, but that's a very different design space, if you will. 
here in DRAM, we're, we're very much latency constrained. We cannot afford that much. But I think, uh, and also I think this, this type of error, as I said, is very easily fixable without ECC. Okay, there are many more observations and results in the paper, but you can take a look at them. Any questions? Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any shame in this. I don't remember exactly. Does the Ahia remember? A is Samsung. Yeah, that's as I expected. <laughs> I mean, not that it matters much, uh, in my opinion. Uh, why, why do you ask? I guess let me ask <laughs> which one is bad, which one is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we used to hide these uh, vendor names in general. Uh, but then I think at some point it doesn't make sense to hide these names also because, I mean, these are real. People should be able to, I mean, anyone can test these chips and uh, people can replicate the results. It helps replication if we, can, if we actually don't hide these names. And there's no reason to hide them, frankly. People, if, if they claim that it's Roham free, well, <laughs> you should stand up by it, right? <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions? There's a lot of stuff we want to talk about. But should we take a break or should we keep going? I think the new room is much better. I'm not smelling. I'm not getting. <laughs> yes. That's a good question. I, I mean, I don't know, frankly. We don't know if there's an attack that's based on Roe Hammer. I don't think that's documented as far as we know. But we may not know also everything. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> With security, if someone's exploiting something, they're not going to tell you. You'll have to figure it out. Once you figure it out, it may be a bit late. <laughs> but, but a lot of people are worried that they might be. Yes. Yeah, potentially, but then emerging technologies also need to be robust. Yeah, a lot of the emerging technology, we'll cover them in the emerging technologies lecture, but a lot of the emerging technologies have similar problems, sometimes much worse problems. Like phase change memory was introduced by Intel. Now they're not working on it as much, but uh, also it, it needs to have characteristics that are good enough to replace DRAM, right? Phase change memory was interesting, but it was never good enough to replace DRAM completely. Uh, as we will discuss in the emerging memory technologies lectures. But I think, yes, there needs to be a lot of investment into emerging technologies, for sure. But we also need to, I think, rethink the architectures that we design around the existing technologies, because it, we're not getting the best out of our existing technologies, in my opinion, as we will discuss in later lectures also. Okay, maybe I'll keep going then. <laughs> okay, let's see where we end up. Uh, so we also wanted to study the new character, other characteristics of Rohammer that we don't understand. So this is, I think, extremely important. Uh, understanding what's going on in existing chips is interesting. No question about that. Existing systems is no question about that, especially if someone claims that they've solved the problem, right? Uh, but it's, uh, it's a bit less fundamental. Understanding what's really fundamental about Rohammer is really important uh, because that can enable you to develop solutions that are also fundamental. And they're also, let's say, robust. That's why we uh, did study a lot of the characteristics of Rohammer. Some of these studies are led by Girai. Uh, he can tell you more about it. Maybe he'll give a lecture at some point, but this paper looks at some things that are not studied in Rohammer as much, which is what is the effect of temperature? What is the effect of aggressor reactive time uh, in terms of the vulnerability? And what is the effect of physical location of the DRAM cells? Like what is the physical variation? And if you understand these properties, you can, again, from the attacker's hat, you can be a better attacker. From the defender's hat, you can be a better defender. And it turns out uh, understanding these is actually very interesting. So we, again, use our infrastructure to be able to do this. There's a temperature controller, as you can see over here, uh, that can control things well. These studies take a lot of time. Uh, so there are fewer chips uh, that are tested. But you can see that there are four manufacturers over here. The fourth major manufacturer is also here. 
although they have a very small market share. Uh, but basically, there are uh, some takeaways. I'll give you a, a few of them that are interesting. Uh, I think all of them are interesting, but a few of them can be potentially uh, more e easier to use. For example, a Roham bit flip is more likely to occur in a bounded range of temperature. Uh, uh, so there's a temperature range where you get more, more likely bit flips for a given cell, and this temperature range is different for different cells, right, Gary? Which is interesting. I don't think we completely understand why but there are some hypotheses as to why this is the case. Uh, the second is if the aggressor row is kept active for a long time, longer time, then uh, keeping, keeping it active uh, only the minimum amount, amount of time that, the, that is specified by the standard. Basically, as opposed to keeping on activating things at the highest possible frequency, just leave the aggressor row active for a little bit more amount of time. Uh, that actually leads to more bit flips, as we will see. And also in certain physical regions of the DM module, you get a lot more bit flips. So these can be used by the attacker and the defender, as I said. So let's take a look at a couple of these. So this one, if you activate aggressor rows as frequently as possible as allowed by the standard, you get to the first bit flip after some number of activations. But if you actually keep the active row active a little bit longer than allowed by, then uh, yeah, uh, then you, uh, yeah, a little bit longer, uh, then to maximize the frequency of activations, I should say, then you actually get to the first bit flip earlier in terms of the number of activations that you need to do. So this is interesting to do. And a lot of the mechanisms are activation count based. Basically, a lot of the protection mechanisms count the number of activations. These are the access counter based mechanisms. And if they're configured to not take into account this, this part, basically, then they can actually, they may not be secure, basically. That's the idea. Basically, you can bypass defenses that do not account for the fact that someone may be doing this if the defense is based on the uh, based on the fact uh, based on the anticipation that someone would be activating the rows as frequently as possible. You would use a threshold, row hammer threshold that's much small, uh, that's much larger than uh, what you need if someone is more intelligent in attacking you. Let's say. So these are actually interesting from that perspective. Okay, so another example. Uh, I'm going to skip these key takeaways. I'm going to show you uh, pictures. Basically, these are uh, DRAM rows sorted by, uh, by reduced uh, activation count. And this is the minimum activation count to observe a bit flip. You can see that, and this is a different, each of, each of these colors is a different DRAM module. You can see that different, mod, uh, different DRAM rows have different vulnerabilities. Some of them require on the order of 250,000 activations to get a bit flip. Some of them require much less. So there are some rows that are a lot more vulnerable than others, as you can see. And this is one manufacturer, but a lot of the manufacturers, the curve is similar. And yeah, I will not look into all of these. This is also true for us across columns also. You can see that this is DRAM row. Uh, each of these are different DRAM rows and these are different DRAM columns. And you can see the number of bit flips in a column is a heat map over here. Some columns uh, are, well, these are different chips, I guess. Uh, some columns are a lot more vulnerable over here. So the question is, how can you take advantage of something like this? Basically, let's, let's take a look at the le leveraging variation across DRAM rows. Some rows, a small fraction of, of rows are a lot more vulnerable to row hammer. They require a smaller number of activations, actually 50% of the activations that the other 90% of the rows require. If you actually know this, and if you can somehow keep track of this, you can reduce the area overheads of some of the solutions. We'll talk about the block hammer solution later on. But area overhead can be reduced because this requires you to keep track of some things at a more relaxed way, right? Because you don't need to put a lot of resources to count everything until HC first. Only 10% of the rows are a lot more vulnerable, so you focus on them a lot more. So this leads to significant area reduction, as you can see. Of course, this may not be easy to implement. There is, I think, more work to be done to really implement this because this requires you to also know this information first store this information, ensure it doesn't change. And that can lead to other overheads. So this paper just makes the observations and says, okay, this could be potentially used for making things better, but that's the future work should actually use them for making things better. So there's a lot more room. Uh, the goal of the paper is really observe what's going on so that things can be better in the future. Uh, this is another example. I think this is even less realistic. Let's put it that way. Basically, 
there's a vulnerable temperature range uh, of a DRAM uh, cell over here. Uh, and if, if, uh, if, if, if DRAM cells are in their vulnerable temperature range, and this is a vulnerable temperature range where we know row hammer bit flips happen. And in all of the other ranges, you don't have bit flip. Identify these vulnerable temperature range for different DRAM cells or different DRAM rows and disable those rows during those temperature ranges. Now, this is, again, tough to do, I think, because once you disable the row, what do you do? What happens to the data over there? You move it somewhere else, maybe. But again, this could potentially be inspiring some other solutions. Who knows? So I think the takeaway is row hammer is, uh, has many more dimensions than what we have observed previously. This is 2021, right? This is seven years after our paper. Yet we're still discovering things about row hammer that we don't know. And this, I think, goes back to your question about the, do DRAM manufacturers have models that are really good? I don't believe they're this good. <laughs> Meaning uh, they need to take into account temperature. They need to take into account all of these different variables, right? And it's very difficult to do. I'm not even sure if they even know some of these interactions perfectly. Because a lot of these, I think, uh, are difficult to know <laughs> without real experiments. Yes? You should ask your eye. I don't think so, but. Mm. Yeah. No, yeah, probably not. That's my guess. But I think it's good to check the data. You can talk to them. OK. Any other questions? These are good questions, because that could be a solution. If it's at a coarser granularity, it's easier to track things, right? Yeah, but I think you would be very lucky to have things at a coarser granularity. <laughs> yeah, of course, the question is, what else is interesting to examine next, right? So gear I in, uh, examined uh, word line voltage, the effect of word line voltage on row hammer. And this is interesting. Uh, well, here you need to control the word line voltage. So he built a little bit more infrastructure, right? Uh, but I'll give you the summary. I'm not going to go into the results. Uh, basically, uh, what is word line voltage? The voltage that you apply when you activate a word line, right? Clearly, this should have an effect on row hammer vulnerability because this really impacts how much electrical interference you cause to the adjacent word lines. Uh, if this word line voltage is very high, the disturbance that you cause should intuitively be high as well. And that's what we find, basically. Uh, the finding is that when you reduce the word line voltage, you can reduce the word line uh, row hammer vulnerability. By some amount. It's not a huge amount, unfortunately. By some amount. Unfortunately, this caused a trade-off uh, because word line voltage affects other things in DM, as we will also see later on. It increases row activation latency because you have now lower voltage and the time it takes for your row to be activated is slower. And it also reduces the data retention time. So the paper shows that this could be mitigated with simple mechanisms relatively easily. So in the end, you can actually reduce the Rohammer vulnerability a little bit, let's say, for a fraction of the, a good fraction of the DRAM chips, not all of them. Uh, but in the end, I think this is the good study to understand, but this is not the, let's say, solution to Rohammer, as I'm sure Girai would agree. <laughs> yeah, so this sort of study is good to understand, but this is a tough one, I think, especially when you play with voltage. Uh, it, it doesn't affect just the vulnerability, it affects many, many other things. Right, and DI manufacturers are actually, unfortunately, uh, dealing with those many, many other things. Uh, uh, it's, I think it's, it's, it's hard to come to a uh, trade-off space that's significantly much better. Basically, I think it's, it's not going to be easy to use word line voltage as a lever to get rid of rope hammer, for example. But it's good to understand, I think. So these studies are important to understand because who knows, like five years later, someone can build something based on this. That's why understanding is really critical. OK, maybe I'll talk about the solutions also, unless people want to leave early. I'll give a choice. We have 10 minutes. <laughs> and clearly, we're not going to be able to finish row hammer completely. So do you want to leave early or ask questions in the remaining 10 minutes? Or do you want to start talking a little bit more about solutions? If you don't, OK, let's vote. <laughs> First of all, are there any questions? No questions. Are there any new ideas, any solutions, Rohammer? 
Yes, you have a solution? Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, basically you're suggesting putting error correcting code in some DRAM banks or somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I think people have proposed somewhat similar mechanisms, not necessarily for row hammer, uh, but more flexible error correcting code type of mechanisms. You reserve some part of memory. Virtualized ECC is one example uh, that was published, I think, in 2011 or so. That's a, I think that's a good idea, interesting idea. Uh, yeah, but once you go into error correction codes, uh, I still think there's a fundamental problem that you will need to correct like seven or eight errors. Going forward, it may be 16 errors, I don't know. That's a lot of space, basically. So it's, uh, it's going to be, I don't know, I didn't do the calculation, but it could be really... Uh, 80% of your space for error correcting codes. At some point, it becomes a bit not so reasonable, basically. You'll need to think about error correction in a different way, in my opinion. And that's, I think, an open area. How do you think about error correction in a different way? So it's just, it's, I don't think it's just a space issue. It's more of a, how do you think about error correction given that we know how row hammer is happening so that we more, more efficiently design things? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good suggestion. <laughs> uh, the question is, how many rows are you going to cache? <laughs> uh, what is the area overhead of it, which is a lot, and is it going to be completely secure? I think that's the difficulty. You could potentially do that. I think, uh, like whenever you uh, actually there, there's a solution. One of my PhD students who recently graduated, Hassan, had this idea of crow. We may cover it. Uh, copy row. Uh, you create an area in the DRAM subarray uh, where you copy rows. And it's kind of like what you have in mind, I think. Uh, it's a clever mechanism because it minimizes the copying overhead, for example. Uh, he does it uh, in a, a judicious way, meaning he uses access counters. If some rows are activated a lot, then he moves them to the copy row area. So I think there's some potential over there. Uh, I see still overheads. Uh, like, when do you really do that? Uh, or is caching, why not refresh if you're going to cache the rows? So I think there needs to be some studies that need to be done. But that's a, that's a good idea, I think. It's good that people are generating ideas. Some of these ideas have been proposed, actually, in literature. Yes, another idea? Yeah. So that's a good one, but unfortunately, uh, Users are very clever. Attackers are very clever. If you don't uh, give them an instruction like CL flush that flushes the cache line, they will figure out how to flush the cache. And people have. Yeah, with evictions, exactly. They basically create the access patterns to ensure that whatever they don't want in the cache is not in the cache. <laughs> so all of those, you can guarantee that there's a smart person. Basically, I think it's a good assumption uh, to say there's a smart attacker that can figure out everything that's going on in the chip and bypass, even though they may not have direct access, like what you said, right? So that was one of the solutions that people early on actually said, but quickly people said, oh, okay, we can flush the caches much more easily at the software level. But they're very good, I think these are good thinking. By treading through previously proposed solutions, you can get to a solution that was not proposed. <laughs> yes. Well, what is 512 nanoseconds? I don't understand that one. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Flush. I see. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it'll take basically longer, what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think people have figured out very quick patterns. First of all, very quick patterns. And also don't trust that 512 number that much because that was based on single-sided row hammer. Double-sided row hammer makes it much worse. And also that was 10 years ago. Today is much worse. So people have shown that by uh, doing uh, what they call CL flush free row hammer, you can actually get these bit flips on real systems as early as 2015. Yeah, but I, I like your thinking basically, how long does it take to flush the cache versus, how long does it take to evict things from the cache using regular instructions versus CL flush that you're not permitted to use? People are very clever. <laughs> Attackers are really clever. You can assume that basically. You can assume, I think it's always a good idea when you're doing security research, especially very critical security research, it's always a good idea to assume unforeseen consequences, as I said earlier. But I think this includes a very clever attacker that's extremely resourceful. They have all the time in the world to figure out what's going on. And they also are very clever in reverse engineering everything in the system. Yeah, I'll point you to those papers. I don't have the have them in this. Uh, Normally I would cover like some literature on row hammer, but CL flash flea row hammer was developed very early on. Actually, I think the, the TU grass folks had it where, where they did this in JavaScript through JavaScript. They used CL flash free row hammer because they didn't have access to CL flash. What else? These are very good questions. Yes, one more, one more idea. <laughs> Yeah. I see. Yeah. I mean, I, I like that idea. Basically, heterogeneous reliability DRAM, let's say. We're going to discuss that also. Uh, we proposed in 2014 in a paper, DSN. Uh, uh, I think uh, there's something, some merit to it. Uh, uh, the difficulty is it doesn't get rid of the problem completely, right? Some, yes, you design some DRAM that's expensive and not vulnerable to row hammer. And most of your DRAM is vulnerable to row hammer. And then you magically partition your data. Someone does it. Okay, even if you partition your data perfectly, uh, uh, you will need to figure out what should go into this really reliable and secure DRAM, right? And can you really make a good decision always? I'm not sure, frankly, uh, because it's not just about security. It's also about data corruption. As we showed earlier, okay, so for example, where do the weights of your model in machine learning go? Do they go into a really secure memory or do they not go into secure memory? Clearly people have shown that they should go into secure memory, right? So everything migrates to secure memory at some point <laughs> what is really not critical, basically? That, that goes to that question in the end. But I think it's a good question to ask. And it turns out it's very difficult to distinguish. Uh, uh, you can eliminate some sort of attacks that way, but some sort of data corruption remains, basically. Now, these are good ideas. I think the heterogeneity is a good idea. We'll discuss that. What else? No one sold it, uh, provided the magic solution yet. Don't worry, it's, it's because it's hard, it's not easy. Altabak will find the magic solution and he will tell you hopefully be, be before the end of uh, the semester. I'm just joking, but it's a good, a good, good thing to shoot for as a researcher. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we're done. Unless there, are, okay, I don't see any uh, burning questions. So I guess I'll see you next week. Have a good weekend and take care. <laughs>